will will generate a lot of food insecurity. But the thing is, the food insecurity in the region will not be exacerbated only by climate change or weather uh, variabilities, but there are other factors as well, such as socioeconomic impacts, insecurity and conflicts, and others. So, uh, so if I go to uh, the positive impacts for agriculture for the mom season, uh, for the first is less weeds are expected, hence reduced cost of herbicides and wet weedings. There is also an expectation of lesser conditions of breeding of desert locust, less minimal post-harvest losses, specifically in Burundi and irrigated uh, wheat uh, producing areas in Ethiopia. There is also a dry condition is will allow repairs of irrigation and the water harvesting infrastructures across irrigated areas. There will be also the positive impact will be reduced occurrences of aflatoxins, uh, aflatoxins because of reduced moisture content. So the expected negative impacts for the mom season for agriculture and food security sector is uh, because of poor crop prospects due to below normal rains, there is a likelihood of water stress and a low soil moisture. And this will consequently result below average harvests to crop failure. There will be also a higher market price table foods are anticipated. There's a likelihood of increase of number of vulnerable households and the, the increased food needs. So there is also a farming condition is, might be experienced considering high acute food insecurity case loads in the region. So this thing is not new, it has been already um, projected in some parts of Somalia. So these are the causes and uh, for the negative impacts for the mom season. Uh, Kabaka, can you please? I went to the left of slide. Sorry. <laughs> now this day is very fast. Okay, let me do that. Can you do it for me? Yes, I would tell you. Perfect. Fix the slide. Yeah. So, uh, sorry about that disruption. Uh, the expected negative sectoral uh, impact for the mom season is continuing. So the, this might trigger reduced resource-based conflicts and a communal conflict, uh, which can drive up food insecurity in the region. So there is, there is another condition, condition is might be conducive for breeding of some crop pests like uh, fall almworm. There will be also a likelihood of reduced uh, investment in crop farming due to uh, consecutive failed se seasons. Soil erosion uh, to, due to flash floods and a likely reduced vegetation cover. So the, the, res the response, the response of uh, measures that will be taken uh, are proposed as follows. So immediate dissemination of early warning information to decision makers. Governments and farmers are advised to promote planting short, range, short season early maturing and drought tolerant crops, varieties and the distribution of seeds and inputs on time. In the case of uh, government of Kenya, it, it's, it's providing subsidized fertilizer to farmers via e uh, which is a good practice to adopt. 
The other thing is governments should undertake regular monitoring of stable food market prices to inform government actions, example, on importation to avert food shortages and balance market prices due to waiver and subsidies. Next. The other response uh, measures that has been proposed is uh, farmers are encouraged to seek professional advice from extension services, promote conservation agriculture practices, like such as minimal tillage, mulching, terracing, kitchen gardening, and um, farmers and introduce evapor trans evaporation of soil and water loss. The other thing is uh, farmers are also urged to undertake regular crop monitoring for early detection and the control of pests and disease. Promote water harvesting practices for crop supplementary irrigation to rehabilitate irrigation infrastructure subsidies. For example, in the case of Tanzania, they are promoting irrigation practices through building better tomorrow or PPT program, which is a good uh, practice. In Kenya, for example, the government has allocated resources to build 1,000 dams, which is a good practice to take up uh, by other member states as well. To promote diversification of livelihoods and uh, other income generating activities, such as ink, uh, beekeeping, poultry, carpentry, and uh, ETC. Next. So at household level, uh, proper use of available food is encouraged. Governments and the private sector are urged to promote subsidies and crop insurance cover to cushion farmers against climate shocks and extremes. Uh, the other response is encourage governments and partners and humanitarian agencies to scale up coordinated humanitarian support such as cash, food aid, assistance to the most vulnerable people to avert loss of life. If the situation, uh, if the situation worsen is declared the road at a national or regional uh, disaster. That's all, thank you. Thank you very much. for making your presentation uh, right on time. Uh, now this uh, next presenter uh, will be from the disaster risk uh, management uh, team. Please come forward to make your presentation. Thank you very much, Chair. I hope I have 25 minutes. Eight. You didn't say eight minutes. We shall add you one. One, okay. <laughs> I have 25 slides. Let's see how we do that. <laughs> so what I'll share with you is more of a consolidated report from the discussion we had yesterday. But a detailed report country-wise will be shared at the end of GACOF uh, program, which will be a summary for decision makers. Let's wait. Uh, don't start counting my time yet. Uh, the support team is trying to have my presentation on. Okay, so we thought of starting with this so that we see where we are at uh, the current state now. This is our agriculture watch uh, that's available at TikTok. But now, this is the forecast that we've been given so far. So the situation is still not so good and this is just to give you a background of where we are and what we anticipate at the end. So we, we went further on before we discussed the impact and advisory, just to look at what are some of the areas that are prone to continue having this drought condition that we have now. So we picked some three cases for Ethiopia, Somalia, and Kenya. And the first graph shows uh, Southern Ethiopia, how the status currently is. The dotted line is the long-term mean, what usually the area receives in terms of vegetation condition. The light green line is uh, the performance of last year, but now this year you see it's actually even dropped down. So this is uh, the start of this year for January. 
So if the forecast still goes as it is, then we anticipate even perform much poorer compared to the long term mean. The same is observed in Somalia and Kenya. So based on this, uh, our team came up with some uh, summary advisories. So further, we anticipate that there'll be more loss of livelihoods. And this was basically more for Somalia, Ethiopia, and Kenya. Uh, also food insecurity as mentioned by my colleague earlier, but especially for Kenya, Uganda, Somalia, and Ethiopia. Sudan is usually a dry season, but they indicated that this time they are likely to have more wildfire events in the northern part of Sudan. But uh, heat stress and wildfire still like Kenya now, there's an issue of uh, wildfire in one of the forests in the country where the sea is also addressing. So these are some of key highlights of impact that are coming up for based on this forecast. And also we have air pollution majorly coming from dust storm, and this will affect more of Sudan and parts of Uganda. Additional impact uh, shared by the member states, uh, we have water scarcity, which is still uh, related to the drought, which is still ongoing in Kenya, Ethiopia, and even this will still extend more to Sudan. Uh, and also there will be some episodes, normally at ICPAC, there are weekly forecasts which are being issued, and these come more with exceptional heavy rainfall, and those are, are likely to lead to uh, some uh, episodes of flash floods. So those were highlighted for Djibouti and South Sudan. South Sudan, even uh, the floods there have really stayed for a while. So much of the farmlands are likely to still continue being affected. So these uh, hazards we are discussing now still lead to more conflict, leading to more displacement. Mm -hmm. In majorly, those four countries are likely to be affected more. So some of the key response measured, uh, measures proposed or advisory proposed by the member states were well, one is to activate the contingency plan. One case, good case example for Somalia was they were to do post disaster need assessment, but they realized if this focus is still indicating worse conditions, then instead of doing post disaster need assessment, then they need to activate contingency plan and see how many people they can save from this. So this was uh, highlighted in all the member states present. And then the DRM and the national med uh, agencies in the country are, are planning to issue early warning this week, some on 28th, some on 3rd of March, as one of the response based on this forecast. And then uh, other elements covered within uh, Kenya, Somalia, Ethiopia, Uganda, water tracking, uh, giving animal feeds to communities that are likely to be affected. And then as usual, we promote these multi-sectorals so that members can actually pull up resources together to see how best they can respond. So that's a summary of what we had, but uh, at the end of GACOF, we'll have this kind of report, summary for, for decision makers for this season, and this will be country-based. So this will give you more details of what we did sector-wise and by country. So you'll get more details on what uh, were discussed by the different member states, and you can put this into your maybe plans or action or response that you're likely to, to have in the countries. So uh, that's what we heard from the DRM sector. Thank you, thank you very much. Please give him big hands. He presented uh, his session only uh, in five minutes. So thank you very much. Uh, the next presenter is from uh, the Water uh, Resource and Energy. Please come forward. Uh, uh, yes. Good morning. Uh, my name is Khalid Hasaballah uh, from the IGAT Climate Prediction and Application Center, and I will be presenting uh, on behalf of the water and energy sector, the MAM 2022 uh, forecast, uh, impact, and uh, advisory. Uh, next. Yeah, we have seen those two maps in uh, this uh, morning. Uh, uh related to the upcoming forecast for the rainfall and 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 and, and temperature and uh, 
Uh, as we can see, the expected uh, rainfall season uh, was expected to be below uh, average uh, condition, so that will have a significant Im implication on the stream flow and uh, the water availability condition within within the region. Uh, next. Uh, so for the water resources, we have made the analysis based on uh, uh, the watershed uh, scales. Uh, uh, so during the break of uh, training and also during the, the, the co-production, we have managed to analyze uh, the stream flow for uh, 137 subbasins within the region. Uh, however, uh, here we are going to present only the major uh, subbasin within the within the region. So starting from uh, Juba, Shibeli, uh, Athi, uh, Iwasuniru, and uh, the Rift Valley, and Tana Basin, and Druvu in uh, Ethiopia, Somalia, Kenya, and Tanzania, where the stream flow is predicted to be uh, below normal. Uh, uh, some of the uh, one of the negative uh, one of the positive impact will be uh, low to medium uh, risk for flood. Uh, however, uh, uh, some negative impacts that is including potential water shortages due to low average uh, inflow to reservoirs and also uh, water related disease uh, uh, and uh, water resources uh, uh, conflict uh, uh, over water resources due to uh, uh, unavailability of water and also disruption of water supply uh, available for uh, irrigation and agricultural activities. Uh, uh, some of the proposed measures to be taken is uh, enhance the, 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 the rainwater harvesting and uh, provision of water treatment chemicals, uh, especially in the areas where uh, we have uh, uh, water contamination, uh, and then uh, more awareness raising on water quality and uh, waterborne diseases and also uh, water uh, conflict resolution plan. Uh, and then efficient irrigation uh, practices and also uh, 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 water, uh, water management, uh, uh, water use uh, uh, management uh, uh, within, within, within the region. Uh, next. Uh, when it comes to uh the bangani bangani wami ruvi and and kagera uh, within the burundi rwanda tanzania and uganda where the stream flow is near normal to uh, above normal condition we have uh, uh, some positive uh, impact will be increase in groundwater recharge uh, and uh, increase in hydropower production uh, however some of the positive uh, impact will be there will be a chance for flood, uh, especially in Kagera and Rufiji uh, subbasins. Uh, uh, therefore, uh, some of, of the proposed measures uh, uh, to be taken by the countries, uh, uh, more effort has to be done uh, related to rainwater harvesting and conjugative use of both surface water and groundwater, and also continuous monitoring uh, uh, for the water resources uh, 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 sources. And then when it comes to Lake uh, Tanganyika, uh, Rusuzi and Malagasy in Burundi and Tanzania were near normal to below normal conditions where uh, was observed. Uh, one of the positive uh, impact will be minimum risk for flood, uh, but uh, also uh, some of the negative impact will be uh, risk of potential conflict. Whenever we have shortages in water, we expect more conflict over uh, water resources, and then also reduction in crop production. Uh, um, and then uh, some of, of the proposed measures is to enhance the water harvesting uh, and water conservation practices and also uh, use efficient uh, uh, method of irrigation and also uh, uh, community uh, awareness raising. Uh, next. When it comes to uh, Victoria Nile and Lake Alpert and uh, the Samaliki and White Nile and Bahr al Jabal and Bahr al Ghazal in uh, South Sudan, Uganda, and uh, Sudan, where also the forecast shows uh, near normal to below normal condition, uh, some of the uh, uh, 
uh, identify uh, positive impact will be reduction in river and lake water levels, uh, which will lead to less uh, risk of floods. And uh, uh, however, also uh, one of the positive impact will be uninterrupted uh, activities uh, uh, for the uh, construction act activities uh, within the uh, region. And then also uh, some of the positive uh, negative impact uh, uh, were identified, including uh, reduced lake and, 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 and river levels, which may affect the intake uh, 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 and, and, and the docking places for the large uh, uh, barges and, and, and ferries within the region, and also reduction of hydropower uh, production and also possible shortages of water resources for uh, different uh, uh, uses. Uh, some of the uh, proposed measures to be taken uh, includes assess, uh, assessment of uh, water intake, especially those uh, on the lakes, uh, so that we, we ensure that there is no interruption for the water supply, uh, and then encourage uh, the conservation and, 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 and storage of uh, water harvesting, and then uh, minimize the wastages of water and then use medium to a small size of boats and purchases for uh, navigation. Uh, when it comes to Blue Nile, uh, uh, the Blue Nile uh, and, 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 and Baro Akobo, uh, all these subbasins within the north part of the region, uh, Wyamam is not the main rainy season, so there is, we are not expecting significant implication on those uh, regions. So, uh, however, uh, we have not identified like the, uh, negative and positive impact. However, uh, proper water management has to be continued. Uh, for the uh, Ogadin, Tugdar, and Nugal uh, in Somali and Djibouti and the coastal catchment where a near normal to low normal condition uh, was expected, uh, one of the uh, positive impact will be uh, uh, good water resources available for the community because those are seasonal rivers. So uh, whatever comes in those uh, river will, will, will have uh, benefit for the local communities. Uh, uh, one of the negative impact also will be uh, less water available for agriculture because those are seasonal rivers and, and flow only for a short period of time. Uh, some of the proposed uh, measures are uh, to enhance the water harvesting. Uh, uh, and conservation and also establishing new water uh, uh, sources, uh, water points like a strategic water point. Uh, and then I have only, I left with two slides. So when it comes, we have also analyzed the, the impact on reservoirs and hydropower uh, uh, plants. So uh, for the Malik, for, for, for those hydropower plants within the north part of the region in Ethiopia and Sudan, uh, since Namam is not the, rain, the main rainy season, so we, we, we are expecting less implication on, 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 on those dumps in terms of hydropower uh, stability and hydropower shortages. So, uh, uh, but in, for example, in Kenya, uh, in Tarquil and Masinga, especially in Masinga, uh, uh, we are expecting uh, 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 possible shortages in hydropower uh, due to the uh, uh, below normal condition observed in Tana Basin. And then also uh, for Gibi and Fincha also in Ethiopia, this is also the, sa the same case because this is not the, the main rainy season, so we expect uh, less uh, implication on those uh, uh, dams. Uh, when it comes to um, Terra, Nyomba, and uh, uh, Monguni in, in, in Tanzania, where normal condition is uh, expected, so there will be uh, possibility of uh, shortage in hydropower production. However, uh, water conservation measures and continuous monitoring of the system is uh, one of the proposed measures. So to conclude, uh, these are the key recommendations. Uh, 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 started from encourage uh, conjugative use of surface and groundwater, and then encourage conservation and storage of water as well as uh, rainwater harvesting. Uh, and then proper water management, uh, water governance and coordination, especially between upstream and downstream uh, countries, and also uh, uh, increase artificial groundwater recharge. Uh, we have seen that this is maybe uh, the, the next season is expected to be maybe the sixth uh, consecutive failed rainy season. So uh, more 
uh, more activities has to be done in this in this field of uh, recharging uh, groundwater. And then finally, uh, continuous uh, awareness raising on water conservation and, and measures has to be uh, taken into consideration. Thank you very much. Thank you, Engineer Kalex, for those insights. And uh, the next presenter is uh, Livestock and Rangelands. Please go ahead. Thank you. Good morning, once again. Uh, I'm presenting on behalf of um, the livestock and rangeland sector uh, from uh, five countries that uh, were present. As I wait, my name is Omalo Kinyanjui. I work for ICAT Center for Pastoral Areas and Livestock Development on the side of animal health. And since we are expecting the depressed below normal rains, the sector is looking at it in a very gloomy way. We thought that the prediction will be good so that we save lives and animals will be saved. But now the situation looks dire. But um, all in all, we heard that in a few cross border areas, there will be something. So we look forward to that one maybe it will help uh, alleviate. But then the problem is that there will be large movements into those areas, degradation, overgrazing, diseases. So uh, one will neutralize the other. <coughs> I hope, I hope you have it. Okay. Mm -hmm. Good. There we are. So um, the representatives were Chiputi, Ethiopia, Kenya, Somalia, South Sudan, and Sudan. Go next. Uh, the positives, they are very minimal, but of course, in those uh, few pockets where there will be some, some bit of rain, is that there will be slight improvement in pasture in areas that will receive the little rain. And uh, there will be improved water availability in few areas, especially Ethiopia, Kenya, South Sudan, Uganda, and Somalia. Then there will be increased survival of uh, the breeding stock, and then good price of animal feed producers, especially for those who produce fodder, crop residues, and feed, because the demand will be high from the other sides. And then um, uh, parsley and acroparsley are embracing new coping strategies. And that is like a production of drought tolerant grasses and water harvesting technologies, especially for Somalia. And I think other countries are also picking that. Uh, next. Uh, the negatives is that uh, there will be increased uh, cattle rustling, especially in South Sudan, Kenya, Uganda, Southern uh, Ethiopia to restock. And then increased punditry for Kenya, South Sudan, Uganda, Southern uh, Ethiopia. Then displacement and death of animals due to floods in cross-border areas, especially Ethiopia and uh, South Sudan. And then increase in vector-borne animal diseases in a few areas that will receive rain. And then environmental pollution from dead animals due to lack of disposal facilities. Next. Then there will be a deterioration of pasture, water inadequacy, depletion, and high uh, evaporation places that will experience drought, and then increased livestock movement in search of water and pasture, increased disease outbreak, especially those ones listed there, then overgrazing and uh, land degradation in locations around water and pasture, then conflict between pastoral communities and with farmers, especially in South Sudan, Kenya, Sudan, and Somalia, then increased livestock uh, deaths, and then decline of livestock productivity in terms of milk, meat, and blood. And then increased spread of uh, transformed animal diseases like PPR, CCPP. And then um, 
there will be increased tick-borne diseases, especially this one in Sudan, because most of the parts of Sudan, they depend on irrigation. So tick-borne diseases will increase. Then further decline of uh, livestock prices for those in poor condition. Like in Kenya, you had a, a, a goat selling at 0.8 of a dollar. And then competition between wildlife and domestic animals over grazing and water. Next. Then uh, what are the key response measures and advisories is that enhanced surveillance treatment and vaccination against expected diseases listed there. That is for all member states. Then support for the bulking distribution and accessibility by affected communities for Djibouti, Ethiopia, Kenya, Somalia, Sudan. Then promote conservation of crop residues for use as animal feed, especially in Ethiopia, Kenya, Sudan, South Sudan, and uh, Uganda. And then promote the stocking where applicable because many of the animals uh, have reduced in number because of death. So where is applicable? Promote the stocking. Then promote livestock insurance uptake, especially under drive. Uh, that is Djibouti, Ethiopia, Kenya, Somalia, Sudan. Then promote conservation of water. Uh, that is construction, rehabilitation, and desilting of the water hauling facilities for all member states. Next. And then promote growing of hydroponic pastures, especially for dairy cows. This is just for dairy cows. It's not for everywhere. It is only for Uganda, Kenya. Then promote peace dialogues between pastoralists, farmers, and those on the move. That is South Sudan, Sudan, Ethiopia, Kenya, and Uganda. Next. And the summer long-term observed uh, seasonal changes is that uh, we need to enhance awareness creation about forecast advisories to last mile end users at the cluster levels so that they can utilize the information. Uh, strengthen resource mobilization to supply animal feeds, water, drugs uh, in uh, drought uh, affected uh, regions, and then strengthen One Health coordination uh, for management of some nurses. That is everything is for all member states. Strengthen cross border cooperation, MOUs to control livestock movement and animal uh, and, and uh, disease control, then promote adoption of alternative communal livelihoods. And then close monitoring of season uh, performance, pasture, and about condition of animals is required and enhance disease monitoring and reporting. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for saving us uh, almost three minutes. Uh, the next presenter will be online. That's on uh, health and nutrition. Uh, the presenter, uh, please uh, check. check uh, the connection, yes, seems like he's coming. Okay, I I'm advised that he's already online. So, um, yes, uh, Dr. Uh, Omai, please go ahead with your presentation. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, moderator. Uh, this is a consolidated presentation. Uh, uh, from uh, Uganda, Somalia, Ethiopia, and Sudan. Uh, South Sudan participated, but uh, we didn't receive the final input from them. Uh, Kenya represented by uh, Kenya Meteorological Department, the representative from the Ministry of, of Health, who was supposed to give the final input, uh, couldn't manage to make it. Therefore, I will be presenting the uh, consolidated uh, input from four countries. Uh, Based on the focus was given and presented by uh, Dr. Hussein this morning, uh, I just zoom in the focus and also zoom out uh, some areas uh, where the risk of uh, climate condition on the L could be uh, seen very clearly and also are reflecting into a negative impact and also the positive side of the season. Uh, for Sudan, uh, actually, Sudan is dry during uh, March, April, May climatology. Uh, therefore, the dry condition, which uh, is start observed from a uh, previous season, which is uh, October, November, December, the impact is going to continue also in March, April, May, or MAM. Uh, therefore, the flu and uh, cold related uh, illness will be 
uh, reduced in terms of the numbers observed compared to previous season and also the cases of COVID-19 because of uh, dry season, uh, because uh, some studies showing the cold condition or the weather when it's cold also uh, contributing uh, to increase the number. Therefore, we consider it as a positive uh, impact. In terms of impact, actually, the impact on the health, some of them the direct impact and some of them uh, uh, come into action as uh, indirect. Therefore, uh, for example, uh, bronchial uh, eczema as a result of dust and sunstorm in Sudan actually is very active during March, April, and May. And also due to the dry condition of the Sudan and the high temperature and also salinity of the water, uh, this condition lead into some people to store water in the open and containers. These containers also going to translate themselves into mosquito breeding site. Therefore, uh, the malaria and dengue fe uh, fever also going to be expected to increase in the number. And also as a direct impact of uh, heat and security of water, uh, meningitis and heat stroke also expected in Sudan. And therefore, when the water uh, quality compromised through uh, the, the, the dry season and also the less rain, and therefore, the, the short uh, shortening of food also being observed in the country, and also the uh, prices is going to be higher, then the result will be uh, food is going to be unavailable and access to this food also become a challenge. Therefore, malnutrition status uh, of the people will be affected as a one of the impact expected in Sudan. Therefore, they put a measures such as a lifting movement for them able to increase the economy activities and also raising awareness about the personal hygiene because it plays a significant role in reducing the food poisoning and also uh, personal related uh, illness and also provision of the clean water and safe water also is very, very, very important where, uh, during the dry season and also the distribution of mosquito which started in previous season will uh, continue and also they will be building the anti-asthmatic uh, remedy to deal with the, the negative impact of the eczema through the dust and sunstorm. Uh, for Ethiopia, uh, there is a chance of prob probability to get above normal rainfall in the areas adjusted to Sudan. Therefore, the negative impact of it, uh, the positive uh, aspect of that will be contributing into the development project which using water, then they will be able to utilize it for benefit of, uh, of people and also the crop industry areas, the, the probability for the crops to be better, therefore the food Hello, nutrition uh, would be increased. In, uh, in terms of negative uh, impact also, uh, uh, there is a uh, above and also below normal exposure in those areas where the foodborne disease and water victim disease also uh, expected in Ethiopia. Therefore, the regional health bureau, they will be able to create an awareness and also estimation of uh, medical uh, supply and also building the personal hygiene to reduce the negative impact of waterborne disease. So for, uh, then for Somalia, also we are expecting a positive aspect in terms of reduction of waterborne disease and also continuous uh, decrease of COVID cases. And then Hello, uh, Dr. Roma, I would like to advise you that you uh, have only, uh, you, you are planned to uh, present this uh, presentation in eight minutes. Maybe you, you were not uh, informed. So uh, if you go by this space, uh, you will need more time. So please uh, focus on the essential highlights for each country and finish. I will still give you some more minutes uh, given the pace you are just doing the presentation. Please be uh, aware of that. Uh, my apologies for interrupting you. Thank you. is a uh, nutrition improvement and also implementation of acute water diarrhea and also key radio message, messages to, uh, to reduce the, the impact through awareness could be implemented. Uh, for, 
for the last slide, which is uh, Uganda and also poor uh, yield uh, production expected in Uganda and also, also water security and also cholera outbreak, especially over uh, Karamoja and also uh, Bunyero and then Zotoro. Then they are putting uh, action in a place such as uh, uh, enhancing malaria civilian in the country and also mass mosquito campaign and also enhancing civilian for health education. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Mai. I thought you were going to present for eight countries, but I recall you, you had only data from uh, four countries. Uh, that uh, interruption I made was, was uh, not necessary. Thank you very much. Please, let's give him uh, one more hand. Uh, okay, now uh, the, the last uh, presentation is from the media team. The media team, you have eight minutes and you know the rule, you are here with us. So uh, the floor is yours. Uh, good morning. Uh, Assalamu alaikum, Karibo. Uh, I'm Atayb Muhammad Ahmed Rejab. Uh, I'm from uh, Sudan. I will present this uh, presentation uh, of media uh, on behalf of uh, GHA countries. Uh, yes, uh, Burundi, Djibouti, Ethiopia, Kenya, Somalia, South Sudan, and Uganda. Uganda. Uh, the first. Uh, firstly, Ethiopia, uh, uh, they have different platforms, including TV, radio, Facebook, were used uh, to disseminate seasonal forecast for the seasons uh, Bega, Belk, and Kemet. These are local names of the seasons of the rainfall in Ethiopia. Uh, and uh, climate service information during the past season. Uh, for Sudan, uh, Sudan has suffered from the floods from the, for the last two years. Uh, and then media uh, role remains crucial, especially in dissemination of the forecast and warning to vulnerable communities, uh, to the media uh, platform. Uh, the media platforms used was national TV and radio, uh, Sudan uh, news agency, which is uh, abbreviated sooner, uh, Facebook and uh, WhatsApp. Uh, for Uganda, for Uganda, uh, Uganda National Meteorological Agency is grateful to Egbak and other partners who facilitating media training, uh, like Egbak of about one th one hundred thirty uh, uh, weather and climate journalists. They now cause uh, wide dissemination of weather and climate information, including any warning radio, uh, include, uh, including any warning. The media used are radio, television, social media, and stakeholders engagement were key. Uh, for Somalia, I think it is a very big uh, uh, graph, uh, exposed, is, is, uh, is exposed to a range of natural hazards, like the droughts and like floods, uh, and desert uh, locust fires and tropical cyclones. They have air warning system and the media that used uh, to disseminate the information uh, is uh, Somali national TV, Twitter and public forums to disseminate the information and also for general uh, awareness. Next. In Burundi, uh, the channel that used to disseminate uh, the air warning forecast and seasonal forecast was the national uh, by the national um, uh, private radios, TVs, uh, newspapers, social media, Facebook, WhatsApp, etc. Uh, in addition to face-to-face uh, -face interviews, uh, for Djibouti, also the, uh, the channels used to display the climate information, uh, official radio and television, and local newspapers like La Nacio, if I speak French very well. Uh, social media such as Twitter, Facebook, and blog. Uh, blog, blog, I think is uh, is local, uh, and uh, email list for the wide distribution of early warning messages of the weather alert to the concerned stakeholder. In Kenya, uh, Kenya yesterday was the was the best 
uh, presentation uh, in the group of media, which he gained the first, uh, the first uh, Kenya. Uh, there is the increased demand of information on when the next season will be begin like uh, the next, like next month, 2023, bearing in mind that uh, there has been drought. Uh, channels used for early warning, just like uh, the, the, uh, the whole countries using t TV, uh, social media, radio, and newspapers, uh, uh, especially during the, the hot season, like erratic uh, temperature. Uh, policymakers in for the policymakers or in government, uh, public and private users for decision making. Uh, the county office were key in providing. Uh, in providing a much needed early warning. Next. Yes, this uh, photos shows how the climate disasters like a uh, hell storm in uh, Uganda and like strong wind also, and shows also how the meteorological institution, national meteorological institutions use the, uh, uh, the social media like uh, Facebook and so on and how the people also disseminate uh, the forecast, like in uh, Djibouti, they disseminate uh, 24 hours forecast and warnings and so on. Even uh, the photos shows uh, in South Sudan, how the mythological people, uh, all, the, all the people in the mythological uh, uh, work, how they make awareness for the people in the private sectors, also in, in military, uh, for military sectors. And also, uh, that uh, photo shows how the the, the, the flood uh, destroy the property and destroy the, the houses in, in Sudan. Uh, and also the photo from Ethiopia shows how the media people, they disseminate the climate uh, forecast. Uh, next. Yeah, the conclusion conclude the best practice uh, that media and meteorological institution can do uh, for promoting or for disseminating the meteorological uh, or climate uh, uh, surfaces like seasonal forecast. The first, uh, yes, it's uh, almost uh, all countries agree to use plants uh, like the best practice undertaken during the last season will be reinforced to promote wider information dissemination and communication. Uh, number two, uh, early warning system must be delivered and disseminated uh, on time or timely using the available media, available media that we mentioned, uh, to take action by the decision makers and those exposed to the disasters. Uh, the final, finally, uh, meteorological agencies should help the, the media uh, through training and skills to do the job, bearing in mind the new trends of climate-related disasters, uh, cons concentrating on time timelines, uh, cause of the disasters, exposing them to relevant terminologies and facilitating them in understanding uh, techniques. Yes, I think the remaining is just to say thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much for uh, uh, the presentation by the media team. Now this brings us to the end of the um, uh, technical uh, presentations uh, at, at uh, multiple levels. Just to remind you, uh, the first uh, three presentations were uh, focusing on the climate system, started uh, by Dr. Stefan on the current state of the global climate system, followed by Dr. Zaudu uh, on the MAM 2023, uh, which is a March, April, May climate out for Africa. And then uh, Dr. Hussein uh, presented the Eastern African um, seasonal forecast for uh, March, April, May, followed by sectoral presentations that focused on uh, the uh, positive aspects of the uh, forecast, uh, followed by the uh, negative aspects and the re response and recommendations. Uh, as I advised you, I'm uh, sure you have a number of questions, even though the time is limited, but we'll definitely entertain uh, the, those questions um, uh, as they come. So please uh, uh, show me by uh, show fund uh, 
uh, who would like to uh, make uh, comments, questions, uh, and what have you uh, to uh, indicating particular session you would like to address to. Thank you. Yes, let me start from my neighbor. Uh, I just wanted to stand so that uh, Dr. Gakun sees me. I went to school with him at the University of Nairobi. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, mine is a general comment. Looking at uh, all the presentations, they paint a very gloomy picture for the region. And I have been looking at what is proposed in terms of the responses and the, what we need to do. But I don't know how we track actions by the member states. Do they take this advice while they are planning for the economy and for the countries? Because this is very good advice. And in most cases, I think what it lacks is that we don't create the interface between research, science, and policy. This is very good information for socioeconomic planning, but I don't know how much of this goes into the plans to mitigate and also to adopt the situations of climate change. I think what we are seeing here is climate change, but the negatives are more than the positives and the impact is very dire, but how do we take this into our planning processes? Mr. Um, the Amber from thank, thank, thank you very much uh, for that very provoking uh, question. I'm sure the uh, countries and the experts around will uh, respond to that uh, uh, to justify to your question. Uh, the next uh, intervention, anyone? I'm trying to move 360, even though I'm not uh, with that uh, stature of uh, athletic, athletic, uh, you know, physique. Uh, thank you. I'm Joel Owani, a consultant social economics at ICPAC. I have like uh, two uh, concerns. Uh, I must the mic, please. Okay, okay, okay. I look at the analysis, but I found uh, the component of gender is grossly missing, and also, you know, SDG. We are talking about leave no one but how about the minority groups? How about people like people with disability? We need to look into that to see how this impact could be negative to them, could be positive to them. Uh, then lastly, what do we have, the backup? The models, uh, the models fail to give some conclusive results in some areas. What backup do we have for such people? where we cannot say you're going to get a normal, you're going to get above normal or below. What do we have the package for such group? Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm sure that is uh, taken note of. Uh, I will respond to that as supporters. Uh, yes, uh, the corner, my sister. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much for the great pre presentation, very informative. Uh, my name is Christina Pio, and I work for the Gender-Based Violence Area of Responsibility that is hosted by the United Nations Population Fund. Um, um, uh, I question the team on health of us. We do know from what we are seeing in Somalia during the drought seasons, we have seen over 10% an increase in the number of women and girls seeking services after sexual violence in drought affected communities. And what does this tell us? It's telling us that probably sexual violence might also increase in the context of drought. And survivors of sexual violence might need urgent uh, access to medical care uh, in order to um, prevent them contracting HIV, STI, and, uh, but also prevent unwanted pregnancies. And I saw I see if um, this is not in a way captured in the health sector kind of prediction. So I'm wondering if there can be some lessons learned 
uh, from the ongoing drought response context and then factored into this. And then to the media presentation, I think it's really great that different platforms are being used in terms of TV, radios, and other channels. But I'm also wondering whether there has been an attempt to explore informal channels because research actually shows that sometimes in many contexts in this region, women might do not have uh, equal access to say radios or even access to TVs, newspapers. Some might even be literate to read information on uh, about early warning. So we sort of do some analysis in terms of who is accessing this information and uh, that actually helps them so far with, uh, with different actors. For the context of South Sudan, Somalia, and uh, Ethiopia, for example, where they are activated humanitarian response coordination mechanism, a number of actors works with women and girls through what they call the women and girls safe spaces. And I think such are uh, avenues that uh, early warning information can actually be disseminated to ensure that women and girls who are disproportionately affected by the impact of disasters access this information in a timely manner. Thank you. Thank you for those uh, very inspiring questions and they are well taken. Uh, one more intervention before we allow, uh, yes. Uh, Thank you, Mr. Chairperson, from the back here. Um, oh. In support of my friend from Uganda, I still have a bit of a problem understanding this forecast because all these interventions are based on the forecast. Our forecast model who says that a probability of 50% we're going to have below normal rainfall. And then it jumps the next probability of the 5% for above normal rainfall. So what are we going to prepare for, for a drought or for above normal rainfall? I think there is a lot of uncertainty in this objective forecast uh, made objective focused. And that is why maybe consensus should be reached even at regional level so that we can talk of below normal rainfall tending to normal with a few pockets of above normal. We, we have to coach a certain language when we're issuing this uh, particular focus. Thank you, Chairperson. Thank you very much. And I see questions are coming on uh, models and uh, the, uh, the, the accuracy, etc. So I'm sure our climate scientists are taking note of that uh, and we'll uh, just uh, come to uh, the, the next question. I recognize it, uh, my brother uh, uh, on the front here, yes. Thank you, Dr. Tesfai. My name is Badu, I'm from IPC Global Support Unit. Um, uh, thank you very much you know, for organizing this uh, uh, session and important, you know, uh, deliberations, uh, which is really very critical for any uh, food security and nutrition analysis in our region. So, so uh, I really uh, uh, appreciate the effort made by the ICPAC and partners and also member countries. One thing I would like, you know, to, uh, it's not a question uh, per se, I'm trying to uh, provide, you know, uh, an insight uh, based on our, you know, previous, you know, practice and experience, you know, how the GAC of, you know, um, uh, a report is being, you know, used and applied, and you know how we want it to be, you know, more uh, uh, used by, you know, member countries. So for the IPC analysis, we are always waiting, you know, for the DAC of report in order to do our projections and also current analysis. This is, you know, very well known, and it's also one of, you know, the key um, driver or uh, input for our analysis. So. Uh, we need to to make you know some recommendation for our you know member countries and also the coordinating bodies you know IGAD and ICPAC and the members uh, how we are mainstreaming you know this data and information and the periodicity of you know this you know data coming through how we are also sharing you know this information uh, with different analysis groups and also with different you know stakeholders so the risk factor monitoring is one of the key factor for us in order to inform early. How early is the early warning system is very crucial and important because the early warning system should be you know, informing the anticipatory action which response you know, uh, planners and also resource partners are taking you know, due consideration and decision-making. So my suggestion is mainstreaming you know, data information 
and the data information sharing, and also synchronizing the data collection timeline with the different you know, food security and nutritional analysis, even other livelihood analysis in the region. So how we are uh, making that you know, uh, action to be well coordinated is an issue that we have to take action. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, thank you, Bellu. Um, now let's uh, uh, hear from the uh, ICPAC and uh, partner uh, partner uh, uh, organizations experts on the response. Uh, probably we go uh, according to the uh, order of the questions, but the model quest, uh, the questions related to models were raised by at least um, two. Um, uh, two speakers, so that can be combined, and I will invite the, the back analysts to, to respond to the model uh, questions as well. So regarding the member states, <clears throat> the question raised uh, first, uh, how, prepare, how, much, uh, how, how strongly are you prepared to take up this and to, to really incorporate it in your planning processes? So that, that question, uh, let's give uh, two member states the opportunity to explain how this is going to be incorporated in their uh, uh, you know uh, planning process at sector levels would like to take the opportunity can i ask the host country then another country will follow to volunteer host country dr john and your team where are you i don't see them Oh, you are, you are here. Uh, I was referring to you, sir. Uh, respond to the, the, the question raised by your brother about how prepared uh, you are to incorporate this in your planning process. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, uh, the question from my former colleague, uh, uh, Yambo. We worked with him when we were doing planning activities at the ministry, but he decided to exit before me uh, I'm happy that uh, he's speaking from what we decided, uh, what we were discussing yesterday, that uh, as a government, mainly I speak on behalf of Kenya, what comes from this type of uh, outputs, and it was a commitment from our cabinet secretary who was here this morning, who said that uh, as a country, we treat these products uh, very seriously, and they are filtered into what... Um, uh, we are planning. We are in the, in the process of uh, 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 of um, coming up with our supplementary budget. And uh, part of what each ministry was tasked to do is to capture uh, the issues of climate change. And that is why you you uh, you heard that um, even our head of state is the, the, the chairperson of the, the heads of state on uh, on issues climate uh, change in Africa and he's steering it. And uh, I think out of the meeting that was held in, uh, in Egypt uh, sometime last, uh, last year, there was total commitment that uh, each country must uh, be able to commit resources and uh, uh, actionable, uh, uh, actionable uh, uh, plans that will even be, uh, be assessed at the end of each financial year. So to us is total commitment, it is not futile, and it goes to all the production departments, and each ministry has its own contribution to make towards the overall uh, achievement of the whole process. So I want to assure him that uh, for Kenya, it is 100% commitment on what comes out of here. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. John. Uh, any other country um, who would like to uh, supplement what Dr. John said about Kenya? Um, yes. Okay, thank you, Doctor. Uh, I'm Hafsa from Sudan. Uh, for this the, uh, seasonal forecast, we used to benefit a lot from the seasonal forecast, especially uh, from JJS because Sudan is the JJS for Sudan is very important. Uh, we used to use use this uh, forecast for the, our plans and uh, we we have to co to coordinate all sectors because our mandate is a coordination of among sectors we use sector, all sector we have 13 sectors and uh, display this um, 
forecast in uh, early warning bulletin. And also we have a higher committee for humanitarian affairs. We raise this uh, forecast to them in order to prepare their plan at uh, national uh, and, uh, and local level. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hamza from uh, Sudan for that addition. I think in the interest of time, let's now go to the, the other questions in blocks that I mentioned uh, from uh, the ICPAC team or the partners uh, working with them on the model, uh, especially uh, on areas that were uh, undecided where the probabilities uh, of above normal, normal or below normal tend to be about the same and uh, the model failed to be conclusive uh, to, to, to give us uh, the direction. Uh, and also the specific remark from Uganda about the model. Um, you can uh, link the data issue and the data sharing that uh, Balhu uh, uh, mentioned with the model because the model is based on the data. So with that, uh, who'd like to respond to that question? Those sets of questions actually. Uh, oh, yes, go ahead. Uh, thank you very much uh, for those questions uh, about on the areas of no confidence. Yeah, I think one thing that we should note is uh, the predictability of the March to May rainfall season. We know that the predictability is very low uh, for the season. And in those areas, we should prepare for all. So we have like 33% for above, 36% for normal and 33%. So we have equal chance for each category. That means we have to prepare for all the scenarios. Uh, on the second one, uh, uh, consensus versus objective forecast and why one category shows like 50% and why um, the, 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 the other category, I mean, uh, the up below shows 50% and the below the and above one shows 35%, but the normal category is very low. Yeah, we noted that one. Um, Partly it is because of the statistical techniques, uh, the techniques they provide low probabilities for the normal category. Um, yeah, uh, so we have to uh, give more emphasis for the highest uh, probability. So if it is 50% for below, then we have to give uh, more weight for that one, but still we have uh, chances for normal and above categories. <clears throat> and the, uh, and we have to also understand the drawbacks of this consensus-based forecast and why we moved to this objective is based on the WMO's recommendation to produce a forecast that is uh, reproducible, verifiable. Uh, and the ultimate goal of that approach is to improve our forecast. So if we do it consensus-based, uh, consensus then it will not take us anywhere. I mean, we can produce that, but we don't know where it went wrong. But the advantage with the objective is at least we know where it's, it went wrong and it will help us to improve our forecast in future. Thank you. Since we're related to gender uh, and um, especially the observations are valid, uh, we'll just uh, uh, do that. Uh, uh, I think that the time I have for this session has just expired and I will go to the next session where Director Artan will host uh, a panel uh, on, on, on the, the transformation and uh, the, uh, uh, the development and uh, it, how the uh, GACOP has evolved over time. So uh, Dr. Artan, uh, the floor is yours.
And uh, I would like to thank the audience and the presenters for the time. Thank you. It's fine. Thank you very much. Uh, we are uh, we're going to the next session. Can we have here as uh, uh, Professor Samanzi? Um, I think uh, the other two panelists, we have four panelists, uh, Michelle McNabb and Max Daly will join us to uh, be there again. So we're here, Gulaid. Uh, Hello. Uh -huh. Hi, it's Michelle. Yes, hello, good afternoon, good morning. Thank you very much. Uh, do I have Max on, online? Yes, Gulaid, hello, greetings and greetings to everyone. Greeting, greeting, greeting uh, Max. Uh, good afternoon and welcome to this session on the Silver Jubilee of Garkov. Uh, Garkov is the great one of Africa Climate Outlook Forum. We have today with us a distinguished uh, lineup of panelists. Uh, and, but before we start uh, on going on the session, I would like to start with the panelists of Garkov uh, process who are not with us anymore. Uh, I would like uh, to start with uh, Professor Lavan Ogalo, who has led uh, this process. Uh, from the start in this region. Uh, Professor Ogalo was the uh, previous director for me. Uh, he took uh, ICPA from a project and he transformed it to an institution. So thanks goes to it. Uh, can we have the pictures? What ha what's, what's going on with our communication team? Are you sleeping? Do you need the coffee? Uh, for those of you who don't know uh, Professor Lavano Gallo. Uh, but also uh, uh, in the past few years, we lost uh, Patrick Luganda, who was really a voice in the communication of Garko. And he was from the beginning on, um, passed away recently. Also, I would like uh, to mention uh, uh, Professor Obasi, whose idea and teaching are imprinted in Garko and on all uh, climate related issues in the region uh, and beyond in the continent. So let's have one, more, one minute of silence. Thank you very much. So, uh, let me start uh, this session. Uh, we live in a region that is climate prone uh, to disaster induced climate prone, disasters that are becoming common. We are at the end in the eastern sector of the region of five consecutive below average rains. And we are on course of seeing the six uh, below average uh, rains. And I will not uh, precede the PR 
publish that. An impossibility if the climate that will not exist is from a simple math uh, statistical one on one that I did. For five seasons, the probability of seeing five seasons below average rains is 0 0.12 percentage. It's 10 percentage of one percentage. And the probability of seeing six consecutive uh, seasons below average has probability of 0 0.4 percentage, an impossibility almost. Improving uh, the production and the use of climate forecast data is one of the uh, one uh, is a key for achieving uh, for climate proofing the region, a region that depends on agriculture and livestock. Garkov uh, Forum has made an enormous contribution to the improvement of dissemination of climate information for disaster risk management and economy. And the core concept of Garkov, as I was saying this morning, is to deliver consensus based, user relevant climate outlook product through a regional cooperation and partnership. The forum brings together national, regional, and global uh, experts to produce an outlook that is based on input, uh, mainly from the national net services and from the regional uh, institution and from global producers uh, of climate uh, predictions. So without further ado, let me go to the panelists of uh, how it started uh, and where we are going. I would like to call first on uh, uh, Dr. Burhani Nianzi, uh, Managing Director of Climate Consultant, of the thinking behind the creation of the Outlook Forum, and who first led uh, Gar uh, Garkovs and how it all happened. Uh, Dr. Nianzi used to be the director of the uh, ICPAC, for it became ICPAC was the Drought Monitoring Center of Nairobi. There was a Drought Monitoring Center of Nairobi, sister organization in Harare. Uh, Dr. Nyanzi was the director of that center from 1999 to 2002. Uh, Nyanzi. Yes. Hello, hello, is it okay? okay? Thank you very much, Dr. Atan. Uh, oh, oh, first of all, for inviting me to come here and uh, for the good work you are doing at uh, the Big Park. Because uh, it's my baby, it's our baby. We walk, we really like to see it moving up the further. <laughs> yeah. Well, basically, I, will, I may not be able just to talk from the head. I will definitely use my notes here because these things actually they started a little bit back. I think, think some of them I've already forgotten. But uh, the issue of climate change was observed to be becoming a big issue towards the 80s, towards the 90, not 80s, 1980s, 1980s. That's when people started realizing that, that climate change is a problem. And with that in mind, there was a call for scale up and the accelerated support for climate change adaptation. Climate change adaptation, of course, initiatives had shown good potential of economic, uh, for economic viability and development. New generation climate change adaptation initiatives needed to enhance adaptive capacity, and adaptation was observed, observed to be the main priority when it comes to addressing resilience to impacts of climate change. This is the idea which was going around during those years of the 80s, 1980s. 
So with that in mind, and other, there were also other global effects, I mean, efforts to see what should really be done to address these issues. In the 80s, African countries experienced severe desertification and in the 80s, and especially the Southern Africa and the Great Horn of Africa. IPCC was established in 1988 to assess the science on climate change. It was more of assessing science. After that, other major conventions came in. The UNFCC, which had started discussing, discussing issues in 1988 or something like that. In, 19, in 1992, was adopted. The what can be done to try to fight this issue of climate change. Of course, there was also UNCC, UNCCD, which is another convention on desertification. This was established in 1996. That's when it was also adopted. Of course, the role. The emphasis was the role of the climate. On, I mean, was the role of climate on drought in the certification process. That was the main concern. They placed, they placed greater emphasis on drought preparedness and the mitigation against the, 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 the normal way which was being addressed by that time, reactive measures. In other words, you act when things come in. But here now the effort was trying to see how can we do this earlier before something happens? Well, with that in mind, Africa started working on seeing how they can work on this. They started thinking of establishing some climate centers, regional climate, I mean, some regional climate centers. Studies had shown that extremes in climate variation oftentimes affected many countries. Therefore, therefore, regional approach rather than a single country approach level, may they felt that it could probably yield better results than just stay dealing with one country. With that in mind, in 1998, 1998, the Drought Monitoring Center. DMC was established with to save 22 countries. That is some countries in Southern Africa and the countries for the Great Horn of, Afri Great, Great Horn of Africa. This was a project supported by UNDP with headquarters in Nairobi and another office, sub office in Harare. That was the time when it was established. It was one office, but with the sub offices. Well, the Harare office, by 1990, the countries in Southern Africa seemed to think that it was not very feasible just to be depending on donor funding. So better to take over this center to be an, a center which is under the responsibility of SADC, so that they, they, they become more, I mean, it becomes more reliable in carrying out his activities. So by, 19, by 1990, the SADC DMC Harare became part of the SADC system. And by 19, uh, 2017, I think they, they moved it to, to Gaborone. While for DMC Nairobi, it, be, it still remained until 20, zero, uh, 2003 when it became an IGAT center. Although I understand the protocol was adopted in 2007 to make it ICAP, uh, ICPAC center. I'm sure some of these statistics or years, you may know it much better, but I'm still within those lines. So now the issue was, if you have, because the issue was not just to establish the regional, the, 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 the regional climate centers, it was trying to see how other 
centers can be helpful. There was an effort to also have a continental center to just be able to get climate data information. This was, this was ACMAT, which was established in 1987 uh, under the support of UNECA and WMO. It was supposed to process data to support national meteorological services, provide climate products, and of course, also it supported, it also supported climate service activities in Western Africa. Because these other centers were, were a little bit far and the ACMAD was there, I think they were given an also a responsibility of taking care of those national meteorological service centers in that region. In that region. There was also agreement, another center, which was also in West Africa, Niamey, the same place where the ACMAD was. This was basically there to deal on issues related to agrometeorology agro and hydrometeorology. That's why they, it is called Agrimet Center in Niger. And specifically was supposed to be working on those two areas. So this effort did not stop there. While these centers were working, WMO was also coming up to make sure that we are being supported. To make sure that there is a program in WMO supporting this center, WMO established a program called CLIPS. CLIPS was Climate Information and Prediction Services. With the, this was specifically established to work on ensuring that there is early warning system for preparedness and management, which took into consideration in seasonal to in annual climate predictions. Okay, then in 1995, the CRIPS Information and Prediction Service, which adopted new science technologies during the development of climate information. In other words, CRIPS became more uh, trying to bring us to a more scientific way of doing things. It was, this program also was the interface between the development of climate information and the products and their applications. And of course, oh, one minute, sorry. Okay, so in that case, It was the clips came with an idea that we needed to have some climate output forums. With these forums, they were being carried, but not in the way, best way. However, there was a, a workshop, very important workshop in this process, called the Kadoma, Kadoma workshop in Zimbabwe in 1999. The workshop resulted in the process of initiating an effective effectively producing a communicated season to inter annual process, uh, uh, annual products and the information, which is the Arakov process. So this was the product of this, uh, what you call this, Kadoma. Uh, I'm told time is gone, but uh, this is just halfway of what I can tell you. I've got some much, much better information down here. So. I don't know what I can do, but this is what I've told you. This is where I can end up to. There are challenges, there are benefits of all these things, and uh, all these things you can get uh, probably later, later through discussions. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm sorry. No, no, no. no. Absolutely, absolutely. No. Thank you very, very much, Nancy. That was uh, very enlightening. Uh, the second speaker is uh, Michelle uh, Magnar, who is Senior Technical Advisor for the Resilience, for, on re, for Resilience at One Rock uh, International. Uh, Michelle, when I first met her, was in 1999, and she was at FuseNet. So uh, 
the Garkov process on the first few years was completely supported by USAID, if I remember well. So Michelle will talk about the motivation and why for supporting uh, Garkov. And her opinion was a great idea. Michelle. Great. Thank you very much. And very nice to be with you all. I wish I were there in Nairobi with you. Um, but instead, I'm in central Portugal on the holiday. Um, but still great to be, be here. I hope you can hear me clearly. Um, I just want to thank all of the organizers, um, and especially to Zachary Thero for reaching out to me after so many years. It, it was uh, great to hear from you and great to see that this process has continued on so vigorously. Also, very thank you for the moving tribute to Professor Ogallo, um, who was obviously very instrumental in the start of this whole process way back in the 90s. Um, in, in the 90s, from 92 to 99, I was living in Nairobi with the Famine Early Warning System Project. Um, as hopefully many of you know, the USAID funded initiative that started in the 80s and continues till today, working with countries to improve their early warning for food, the possibility of food crisis. And in those days in the, in the 90s, one of our key partners was the Kenya Meteorological Department um, with Zachary and all of the colleagues there. Um, and we worked very closely together to make sure that the meteorological information was fully understood by policymakers, donors, and that we were able to predict any upcoming problems. Uh, so in those days, working together as the DMC was, was getting started, um, we just continue to realize that a lot of the scientific information that was available wasn't being fully understood by the policymakers and, and people doing emergency planning. So we continue to work together very closely. And around that same time, the US government set up something, a uh, presidential initiative by President Bill Clinton called the Greater Horn of Africa Initiative, GHAI for short. And the GHAI, I managed to find some old, old documents from the initiative um, because much of it has been forgotten. Um, unlike other presidential initiatives such as PEPFAR from President Bush and Feed the Future from President Obama have lingered on, but the GHAI has somehow been forgotten over time. But when it was set up in 1994, it was tied to the revitalization of EGAD. That was back with the EGAD with two Ds days, which some of you probably remember. Um, but the US government's um, purpose for funding the GHAI was just a couple of things that I think are directly relevant and very, very interesting to what is happening today. And that's the first objective was to strengthen African capacity to enhance food security. And then the other uh, objective was to improve access to regional analytical information. And so even if the GHAI has been forgotten, I would say that those two objectives are still very important and being met partially by the work of you all are doing today, strengthening African capacity and improving access to analytical information. So just a, that little bit of history with that Greater Horn of Africa initiative, um, so in those days when, when Zachary and, and Professor Agallo and I were working together to try to understand the impact of uh, some of the new phenomena that were being understood on El Nino and La Nina and so forth, um, we all heard about a climate outlook forum that was held somewhere. Maybe Max will be able to tell us where it was held or someone else on the panel. Um, somewhere in the world, there was a grouping of regional scientists and policymakers that got together um, and we thought that sounded like a great idea for our region. Um, and so through conversations with USAID, who was providing the funding for my FUSE, my FUSE activities and um, other things in the region, we proposed to USAID that we would like to bring all 10 countries that were part of this Greater Horn of Africa initiative together. Um, we'd like to bring the meteorological departments, We'd like to bring the food security and early warning departments, as well as the hydrology and water departments together in Nairobi. And for some reason they said, yes, they said that we could have the funding. And so Zachary and, and the rest of us started to organize this event. Um, 
which was unprecedented for our region, first to get this group of countries together um, and to bring the climate scientists together with the policymakers, the food security practitioners. Um, so we had a wonderful event. Um, and I think if I remember right, all 10 countries came from both, both the uh, Met departments as well as the, the food security and agriculture and policymakers. Um, and we managed to have everyone there. We had a slight, if I remember, a, a slight uh, problem because we invited um, participants from Juba, from Southern Sudan, what we called Southern Sudan in those days, um, as well as from Sudan. So that was a little bit of an issue that we were maybe a little naive about, but all countries arrived and all countries sat down together and talked about how this new climate science um, and this understanding of the connections between El Nino and La Nina could be used to develop these seasonal forecasts, which could help policymakers get ahead of, as was mentioned in the previous um, intervention, get ahead and, and do um, warning of potential problems much earlier in the season. So even though a lot of this work uh, from the very beginning has, has been lost, I, I'm very happy to see that uh, the really important stuff continues. We're still trying to understand how to do a better job of, of predicting um, the future, uh, both in the next few months as well as longer term, so that we can take the actions necessary to support the region. So thank you for having me here today and um, very happy to be part of this process. Uh, thank, thank, thank you, Michelle. Um, thank you for the support. Uh, the third speaker is uh, Dr. Max Daly, who is the director of, of the climate program and climate coordination, and David, director of service uh, for the WMO. He's gonna join us from uh, Dieter Lien. Uh, Max, when Garkov started, uh, if I remember well, he was a, a research scientist at, at the International Research Institute for Climate and Society, also known as a ARI at Columbia University in New York. So uh, Max uh, will uh, uh, focus on, 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 on the beginning of uh, Garkov and would like to hear his perspective on how it evolved and the transformation. Max, to you. Thank you, Gulai. And um, I, was listening earlier uh, to the presentation of some of the uh, climate conditions and their anticipated impacts and uh, wanted to share the reflection of some of the participants that this is a, a rather dire situation um, affecting the region and even more so when I was listening to your calculations of the the probabilities that this is just a, a random series of uh, circumstances and rather that it, it may be indicative of, of more to come and uh, that of course would not be uh, a good prospect either so um i think it just underscores uh the importance and the continuing and even the growing importance of of this process now um just briefly to expand on the kind introduction you gave i was um at usaid uh, with Michelle um, at uh, back in the day, and then moved from IRI, and then um, after that to WMO, uh, from which I retired uh, about six months ago to focus on greenhouse gas uh, mitigation. But um, during the time that I was uh, involved in the in the, the Climate Outlook Forum process, uh, we uh, happened to have the massive El Nino of 1997 and 98. And this really did accelerate um, the activation of the ARCOF process that had been in the planning stages for some years before that. And in rapid succession from uh, September of 1997 in Kondoma, Zimbabwe, through to October in uh, the Horn of Africa, uh, we had the Prasau, what's now the Prasau Forum in um, the Sahel. Uh, the, the forums um, were activated, and, and since then, as, as you um, very nicely described, um, and thanks to the 
efforts of, of uh, Professor Ogallo and all, all of the ICPAC staff, they, they've really become institutionalized. So I want to talk just briefly about, um, you know, kind of where, coming from where it has come from to where it's going. Uh, but I, before that, I just uh, can't resist um, expressing my appreciation to to you and all of the the people that have been involved with um, Gakoff over the the decades now, and um, also to extend a really warm greetings um, not only to my fellow panelists who I haven't seen in quite a few years, but but also to the ICPAC staff and the experts uh, and the participants that. Uh, really deserve the credit uh, for what's been accomplished. Um, Guled, you, of course, and, and Professor Ogalo, but also Atheru, and, and more recently, um, Zudu and, and Richard Graham, and, and of course, the NMHSs uh, that uh, are um, really the, you know, the mainstay of this process. So um, one of the real highlights uh, moving into the subject matter now, uh, in my career even, was Gakoff 52 because uh, I had the privilege of witnessing uh, a transition, a very important transition from a primarily consensus-based outlook to one that had an objective foundation um, in which the human judgment was applied to determining what was the best model combination um, that would give the most robust level of skill and the, the highest skill and then um, the, the results were presented based on um, how that model, um, how that model uh, revealed them. And um, I uh, really congratulate uh, ICPAC and the Gakoff for having uh, achieved this. It is uh, the first time this was done in Africa and probably one of the first times it was done um, globally. And it is um, completely in line and representative of what WMO um, is still trying to do and what we were trying to do when I was still there, uh, which is support the transition from expert judgment applied to the forecast itself to rather applying expert judgment to the forecasting process so that the forecast can be delivered operationally and in a in a relatively automated fashion the way that uh, weather forecasts are currently generated and um, this will allow a continued process of skill assessment to be uh, applied to the different um, configurations of models that would be involved and then um, for a continuous improvement in the forecast skill um, to be realized and this is important not only at the regional level, obviously, but also it allows for the national forecasts um, to draw on the regional model outputs and um, to do bias correction and other kinds of downscaling to really optimize um, what kinds of forecasts can be delivered at the national level. And the national level, as we all know, is really the most important level because this is where all of the decisions are being made that are going to um, hopefully result in the best kind of socioeconomic outcomes under the circumstances that uh, people are dealt with um, based on the on the seasonal climate. So um, because of the importance of that decision making process at the at the local level, um, now that this uh, foundation has been laid of um, objective operational delivery of seasonal forecasts, we're at the point where it's possible to start operationalizing the delivery of tailored products for supporting certain kinds of decisions in these sectors that uh, we already saw uh, reviewed earlier this morning. And um, these tailored products can uh, involve a very diverse uh, set of variables beyond just rainfall and temperature. It could be um, vegetation for livestock, or it could be inflow into a reservoir for uh, operating a, a, a reservoir installation, a hydropower uh, facility, for example. And um, instead of just giving the, the, the tercials that we normally give, we can give probabilities of exceeding certain thresholds that might be relevant for, for that particular application. And because of the automation involved in operationalizing a forecast system, 
it becomes possible to calculate those uh, exceedance probabilities and, and the ranges of values around these different thresholds um, in an operational way and to make that information locally available through the national meteorological and hydrological services who can who can deliver this to the to the public and to these different um, sectoral professionals uh, through their various means. Um, these can be national climate outlook forums where there's an opportunity to discuss, but it can also be automated through websites and, and um, cell phones and uh, radio and so forth. So um, there's a process now that's ongoing to really refine the requirements and the specifications that are needed by these different decision-making um, constituencies and um, to come back to them with operationally um, delivered products that really meet those requirements. So um, it's uh, encouraging to see that the steering committee of GACOF is now starting to engage with these constituencies on that design process. And that's something, um, of course, that uh, I personally would, would very much uh, do very much encourage. I'll just conclude um, with a, a couple of words specifically on the, on the early warning um, aspect, because this is something that's been highlighted. And of course, it, it remains a very important, um, generally uh, useful um, type of products and services. Um, as I was leaving WMO, the Climate Risk and Early Warning System project was already in the process of um, ramping up to provide support to GACOF for the improvement of early warning systems. And this, this involves um, strengthening um, at the regional level uh, things such as the assimilation of long-range forecasts from the different uh, global modeling centers and operational data services, but it also involves strengthening the linkage between that um, regional uh, modeling uh, process and the national level. And um, this uh, is enabled by a variety of technical tools that I won't go into um, under the general heading of the Climate Services Toolkit. So um, when you couple that with the national capacity building processes that are also being supported through this project, um, I think there's a real opportunity to bring state-of-the-art early warnings um, to the public in at the national level in, in a region which is obviously um, very, very exposed to a lot of climate variability and extremes and potentially even climate change. At the same time, um, people's livelihoods and um, national economies even are very much are very sensitive to these fluctuations. So um, it, it really has been a privilege to conclude um, to have been at the very first ARCOF uh, in uh, GACOF one, and now um, the, uh, to have been invited to just share these reflections in in the sixty third. And um, I am very encouraged to see this continuous evolution and the, uh, the progress that's being made and, and look forward to seeing more to come. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so uh, let's go to the uh, last and fourth panelist, uh, uh, Professor uh, Fred. Semanzi, who is a uh, professor, professor emeritus at, at the North Carolina State University. Uh, professor Semanzi is a numerical uh, weather uh, model developer. It's not a forecast, it's a model developer. So, uh, and Professor Semanzi has been involved in, in the Garkov process from, from the beginning. Uh, I would like to hear about his thinking about uh, Garkov and the introduction of, uh, especially uh, climate change. Into Garkov has evolved from uh, throughout the years. Uh, those of you who haven't been in Garkov for a few years, you will know that now we have different sectors and we have included climate change in 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 the in the lineup of our uh, programs in Garkov. So, uh, Thank you, Dr. Atom. Um, I'm very honored and uh, happy to be part of this gathering, uh, celebrating the uh, 25th anniversary 
of um, Garkov. There are many reasons why I feel this way, um, which I can't go into because in the interest of time, but uh, one that really comes to mind um, is that I was blessed uh, 25 years ago uh, to chair uh, the meeting at Cardona, Cardona that uh, uh, Dr. Nyezi mentioned about, uh, which actually gave, the birth, gave birth to uh, the Climate Outlook Forum uh, uh, concept. Uh, I, um, I recall one distinct um, outcome from that meeting um, so it was attended by about 200 people, about 100 from the climate providers and about 100 from the application side. Um, and during a plenary, we challenged the climate information providers and asked them to list five areas these are the people who provide the forecast. And by the way, they are coming from all over the world. Um, it was not just this region. Uh, meeting was sponsored by the Department of Commerce, uh, US Department of Commerce. And uh, so we challenged the, uh, in the plenary, the climate information providers. Um, what are the five things or products they are most proud of? And we also challenged um, the climate information users. What are the five things they thought were most useful to them? And then we went out into a breakout for the two groups. We convened back in the plenary and they reported back. And as it turned out, there was absolutely no overlap between what uh, the folks from the uh, providers uh, thought were the first five things they were most proud of and the, what the users wanted. Uh, and one interesting example, um, the providers told us that they are very proud of the product that comes from the 500 millibar forecast or prediction. 500 millibars, for those of you who are not meteorologists, is about five kilometers from the surface. This really caused an uproar in the, among the, the users because they have been brought all the way to this place. And now these guys we are boasting about uh, how good they are in predicting the climate or, and, and weather at 500 millibars. The actually scientific region, reasons why the uh, information was presented this way, because that is a steering level. And at that time, the computers were not powerful enough. So you focus on one level, more or less one level, so that you can cope with the computations. Of course, the physics was also lacking, but the, this is the reason why they presented this way. Uh, and of course, uh, that um, uh, the users were not, um, familiar with that. So you can see uh, this was a clear demonstration of lack of communication between the two groups. I believe the providers of the information could have presented their, their, their um, uh, capacity, capability in a somewhat different way that would communicate to the other community. And actually at that time, the concept of the need for the Climate Outlook Forum was born. It was clear that what you needed in the future was for the two groups to work together to produce these products. And uh, so uh, that, that, that was extremely important. So, and it was not years later uh, in 1988 that um, the, uh, um, the, 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 the first uh, climate change Gakov session was held in 1988. Uh, that is 20 years, I think about 20 years, if my calculation is right, uh, after the um, uh, 
the birth of the Gakov. And, and part of the reason is that the climate projections were, they, they did not have much, people did not have much confidence in them to actually um, uh, develop something parallel in the climate arena. So by uh, 1988, it was felt that it was enough confidence and it was time to launch such a thing. That climate, climate um, gap of climate change component was designed as a capacity building event um, uh, to capitalize on the uh, traditional seasonal uh, prediction gap of uh, uh, legacy. Uh, the setup is, is uh, uh, similar in many ways to the seasonal component format. Uh, it's highly participatory where each GHA member country uh, uh, has a small team of participants and there is an allowance for a lot of participatory dialogue among the participants and experts. Uh, to come to a consensus. But of course, difference is the, the time scale, uh, because now, of course, uh, the climate change does not really look at things from a season to season, it's looking at the long term. And the main challenge there is how do you reconcile the fact that the projections are 40 years away, but you need to make policy on a one to five year time horizon. So this is a huge, huge, huge question. And um, at this uh, launch um, workshop uh, within GACOV um, uh, framework, uh, the idea there uh, that we launched was to actually um, work from the future backwards. Since you know that you have the projections, you can actually estimate what the impacts would be and then you work backwards in small increments of five years up to the uh, present to uh, determine or decide how, what action you should be beginning to take at this point so that you'll be where you want to be uh, 40 years from now. So it's a little bit of an interesting um, approach uh, funded by the High Crystal Project, um, by the UK government, and um, the three of us that were involved in that is Barbara, uh, uh, Barbara, Barbara Evans of Leeds University, uh, David Rowell of the UK Met Office, and myself. And, and, and this was thought a good way of starting this process, but of course, quite open for improvement. And I'm fixed, I think that's where the biggest challenge actually lies at this point. But they are also, uh, in my concluding um, um, remarks, I'd uh, like to uh, comment uh, uh, very briefly on the way forward where I see major gaps. In a way, Max actually touched on that as well. And I see the main gaps really, um, one is in the research itself. The need to develop that um, link between the actual scientific climate projections decades from now to uh, policy making. So it's really in the applic application arena. Um, but the other need um, also, which I see, is a need to build on um, ICPACs and uh, GACOFs training capacity, um, legacy, if I may call it, uh, which has been so successful during the GACOFs, as you know. And I, I think extend it more broadly to governments, professionals, um, administrative uh, levels, all the way from parish to higher up, where thousands of uh, professionals need to actually internalize and understand what um, this whole issue of climate change is about and how we could integrate the information for policy making. Uh, but I think there, the knowledge, there's a knowledge gap uh, among those critical people in the wheel as it turns, uh, where the training here could actually be expanded to help out there. And I, I think of ESA, they have to be a link at the national level. Uh, so that's the second area which I think is important. Thank you very much. I'll stop there. Right on time. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Samanzi.
and quite informative uh, and very engaging. And luckily, we're almost on time. But uh, since I have the microphone, I want to do a few things before I open uh, for questions. Uh, Zakir Atiro, can, can you? Uh, Zakir Atiro has been with ICPAC from the start. And he has been with, with the Garkov process from day one. One one reason one reason Garkov is successful. I will take some some of the uh, dues maybe, but it's because of him. Uh, in Africa, usually when we have a revolution, it doesn't end up well. But when we have evolution, is good. So we have an evolution of the Garkov process because we have a memory of what has happened from day one. Uh, thank you very much, Zachary, for the service. And um, I will give you maybe two clubs. Uh, as you have noticed, also, there is a we're moving to uh, an objective forecast. For those of you who used to come for Garkov, in the old days, it was uh, comparing basically with uh, atmospheric graphics and 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 and. and, and uh, agreeing where the line was going from. Uh, a gentleman who has been instrumental for, for us implementing that is that, uh, can you uh, go up, uh, uh, Dr. Zudu? Although, <laughs> although, although we had this agreement on first, uh, and, my, and myself, I was a bit reluctant actually. Even. So, uh, but, Sometimes you need some people with strong heads to 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 drive you. So, with discussion and and if you prove your your point scientifically, uh, unlikely Zuda has left us with now and has been pointed by Noah. So thank you, Zuda. Still is supporting us. Uh, also, I would like if uh, Dr. Hassan, uh, Julie, uh, I I cannot see you if you. Raise up. Uh, one thing that we are trying to do is also we're moving to an impact based forecast from what the weather will be to what the weather will do. And the gentlemen and few of them who are not here are instrumental in it. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Hussein and Ms. Salim. Ms. Salim, she's, she's around. Dr. Hussein, can you? Go? Uh, where is Masalim? These are the new generation. <laughs> they are they are doing the forecast uh, for ITPAC. So thank you very much, and I hope uh, that uh, in twenty years you will sit here. So we'll, we'll ask you. Thank you very much. Uh, now let's move. Uh, we have a few minutes, not more than ten minutes. If you have any question to the panelists. Please uh, take the microphone and, and ask. Uh, uh, I see the PR of Djibouti, uh, uh, Mohammed. Uh, you have two microphones, so take it out. Anybody else? Uh, uh, Abebe, will, will, will go next. Mm -hmm. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I, a student cannot say to his professor, you are wrong, but I want to, to, to correct the date. Niazi, what he's talking about, the creation of the national audit and about uh, ICPAC. ICPAC had changed the name in the drought monitoring satellite. It changed, changed the name in January 2000. The 89th summit of the president of Africa in Khartoum. It was 2002, January, that the drought monitoring center became ICPAC. Yes, sir. 
I don't know, it, yeah, the first protocol was signed. Oh, okay, okay. And, uh, and also I, my first, my first, he was my, yes, I, yeah, I say student because he, he trained me when I was doing my focus in the IGPAC. I, I am also the product of IGPAC because before coming PR, I start from the grassroots. I start from the forecaster, the go to manager, then the DG today at the PR. Mm -hmm. And even I know Professor, uh, he's coming up to North Carolina, he gave us some lectures. Uh, in uh, Artan, I know since uh, 2000, we meet uh, at Kisumu. I remember the, fa the, the 5th February 2000, 2000, we meet in Kisumu. He was young, only carrying his bag, talent student, and talent uh, always active. We know each day. <laughs> but today he's the director of the APAC and I'm the director of the National Intelligence Agency. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, for giving me the chance. Uh, I'm really, really excited with the great panelists who has given us the historical evolution of ICPAC, GACOF, and DMC. Uh, I learned a lot, really. And this needs to be very well registered, maybe a book or something like that. Uh, my question is to Dr. Nianzi. Uh, in the establishment of uh, DMC, there were two uh, people who contributed, I assume, uh, like uh, people uh, from Ethiopia, Mr. Warkine Dagafu, from Kenya, uh, Mr. Evans Mikwele, uh, I think they are still alive, and I was expecting them even to be part of this uh, uh, gathering. So I would like to hear uh, uh, what their role was in establishing DMC, ICPAC, and so on. Over to you. Thanks. Thank you, Professor. Uh, thank you, Mr. Abebe, is your question is for uh, Nancy or for me? Yeah, yeah. definitely. Uh, the GAFU is the first director of ICPAC. Uh, there's no doubt about that. Just Garkov started uh, when he left. So uh, ICPAC was established in 89. The first Garkov was in, in 98. I think the GAF who left uh, uh, Zachary can help us on 90 what? 91, 92. So it was way after he left. But definitely, it's not the, uh, uh, the last time I met him, I told him, I need a picture of yourself and uh, uh, to be on the hallways of Iqbal. So I can also go there when I leave. But if you are, uh... well, thank you very much. Uh, you are very correct. The first director of ICPAC was uh, Mr. Wakin Degefu from uh, Ethiopia. In fact, he's the one who recruited me as a consultant to work with the other. Me being the scientist helping him, and the other was still my trainee. But today he's my boss. So that's that's what I know. He well, he did. Uh, uh, the GEF did his best to make sure that the center said he started well. Mkolwe, I think he was the director, if I'm not wrong. That his 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 main contribution is that he was the director. Of of Kenya Metrological Department. So with that, as the host director, has usually a, a, a lot to do to make sure the center survives. Otherwise, it doesn't survive. And during those early days, because it was just depended on the support from donors, governments had not started supporting these things. It was mainly from donors. So I think that's what I would say the role he played during that time. But since I've got this mic, I definitely would wish, I would have wished to make to you to know those recommendations which came from Kadoma. 
which I didn't read, but you can get them. I have the presentation. If you want, whoever wants those, you can get them from ICPAT people because those are really very important. Those are the ones which tell us who's supposed to come out for these things, for meetings, how we should involve the users, and all these things, they are from that meeting. As he said, there were many people from different uh, categories and the institutions, global. Don't forget that ICPAS, ICPAC's work has resulted to making other centers in the world, in the globe to be established, similar centers. We have brought people from South America to come and learn what's going on in ICPAC. I remember to have brought people from China to come and learn in ICPAC. In ICPAC. So definitely our work is definitely, we have to be proud. This is something, an example globally. And I'm happy to hear that it is still going doing very well. Thank you. Thank you, Nancy. Uh, one question, if you have it, otherwise we'll close, actually. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Um, uh, housekeeping lunch is on the second floor. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Everybody. Bye. I, you, you guys, I, I, I have a, I have a book. I have a book which I have written up on this, on this history. Well, it's, it's actually explaining about me. All these things we are discussing is in that book. If you need that copy, I have about six copies here. You can get a copy. But if you don't want, don't. No, 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 I'm not giving away. You, you have to do some little.
Can we take our seats? The last time we met was in two thousand and no, we met that we work together. My teacher exactly to the first year to be here. We used to be in the room, but the room was at uh, good afternoon, good afternoon. Let's take our seats and then uh, we are about to start our session on the release of the seasonal forecast. I would like to invite uh, Dr. Atan and uh, Dr. Gekongo. Can they join us here uh, on the podium? Uh, you are going to speak. Uh, good afternoon again. I think uh, in this afternoon session, uh, we are going to have the release of uh, the GACOF 63 statement. Uh, but I would like to recognize uh, the presence of uh, Engineer Mabu Malim, uh, the former executive secretary of Wigan. Is here with us to, I think it was not in the morning. And uh, now I think it's my honor, it's also there, uh, to invite Dr. Atan uh, I, I, before Dr. Atan come also, I, need, I would like to, re, uh, to recognize the director of IFRC Africa region, uh, Dr. Mohamed Omher, welcome. I think they have joined us for the session which is going to start after this. Uh, they were not with us in the morning. Dr. Atan. Thank you very much, uh, Zachary. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I, I think we're, <laughs> we're lacking caffeine, I suppose. Uh, but uh, we're almost at the end of uh, Garkov 63. Uh, this has been a process. Uh, as as you might, some of you might know, Garkov is not only uh, the last three days, is a, is a process that there was a work uh, workshop uh, for climate and sectors at the part the week before and the preparation. So that has been a long process. Uh, and, and, and most of that is thanks to the, uh, uh, the logistic team that, at the ICPAC, uh, Barbara and uh, Augusta, Fortune, if you're around, you can raise your hand. So give give them an applause, really. They have done a wonderful job 
Also, I would like to thank all the uh, repertoires and uh, moderators and contributors to the various uh, sessions that we had for the last three days. Uh, a lot of knowledge was exchanged and a lot has been accomplished. Thank you very much for your dedication. Uh, as I said uh, in my uh, talking points two hours ago on, on the civil jubilee of uh, Garkov, we are really in a present day time. Well, we have seen five consecutive uh, failed uh, rains in the Eastern sector, something that's almost mathematically impossible. If, if we assume these are a random events, we will give 33 percentage probability to below average, 33 to average, 33 to above average. Uh, that translates to a very, very low probability. That's almost impossible to happen. But if there is still probability, it means that it can happen. And, and we are on course for the sixth season. Uh, before that, we have seen uh, three seasons that were before uh, the drought started that were well above average. Actually, uh, MAM, OMD uh, of 19 and OMD of uh, eight, uh, uh, 19 and OMD of 18 and MAM of uh, 120 were one of the rainiest seasons on record in the region. So we went from a uh, flood to drought. I might add that still there are some sections in the Western sector of the region that are under flood. So it's not all uh, drought. Our uh, late, latest figures are showing uh, around uh, 46, uh, 47 million uh, people in need of uh, humanitarian need, uh, where if you compare to the 2010, 2011, was around only 10 million. So we have uh, rising rising numbers of, of uh, people in, in need of humanitarian aid. Uh, it's time to rethink uh, how we can plan for humanitarian assistance and resilience building. Um, I would like to thank our uh, international partners on that. Um, we need to build a climate forecasting capacity for the region to climate proof this region. Around 60% of the economy of the region depends on rain-fed agriculture or uh, livestock. Uh, as a regional climate center, ICPAC, uh, it's leading uh, and it's playing a role in strengthening the climate forecasting and uh, the multi-hazard system air warning. Uh, for those of you who haven't seen our East Africa uh, hazard watch, if I remember well, it was being presented on Monday. Uh, please uh, follow that. I might add also that uh, although our forecast throughout the years. Now we have a long, long record of dark office. Uh, except for a few years, we have been above 80 percentage on our uh, uh, prediction uh, capacities. But still, I will suggest for uh, to you to follow our monthly, monthly forecast that has a higher uh, uh, prediction skills and also your uh, national uh, met agencies forecast. So as the season comes closer, our ability to forecast becomes better. Uh, I, will, I, I would like to thank, uh, uh, before I give the microphone to the director of Kenya Met uh, for the readout of the forecast, our partners, uh, Definitely, big a big thanks goes to the to the med agency of the region. Without you, this wouldn't have been possible. 
So thank you very much for your support throughout the years and, and for your support for, uh, for this dark process that we all own. Uh, I would like to especially uh, give special thanks to the European Union, World Bank, GIZ, and uh, the Fashion Fund for their help in making this uh, uh, event possible. As we're celebrating the uh, civil jubilee of, of the event, the longevity of the event speaks for itself for the usefulness of the Garkov process. And now I would like to give the microphone uh, to, to uh, Zachary uh, for the MAM uh, forecast. Mom, uh, 20, 2023, with my friend and colleague, uh, David Kipungo, Director of the Kenya Meteorological Department. Zachary, so if you can invite. Uh... Thank you, Uh, thank you, Dr. Tan. Uh, and uh, as the moderator of this session, I want to modify a little bit. Uh, we want to close after listening to the next section uh, because we don't want to close and listen. So I, I, I want to modify and invite Dr. Hammond to start a session and of course even invite then now after that we invite the director uh, of Kenya Met to close. We don't want to close and open. Uh, Dr. Amen, please. Thank you very much and uh, good afternoon all. Uh, I think it's uh, a pleasure again to come uh, back after lunch. We'll have two sessions, uh, colleagues, this afternoon. The first one is a side event, which is uh, on the devastating drought. We have mobilized a uh, high level actually panel, commissioners from Ethiopia, Kenya, and Somalia to tell us what's really going on as the drought, the prolonged drought actually unfolding in the region. Uh, colleagues, without a further ado, I'll be inviting uh, our distinguished panelists, but before that, uh, I have to tell you that uh, Mr. David, uh, the director of uh, Kenamet, will be closing this, will be reading the statement and also closing uh, the session at the end. Uh, in that order, may I now invite um, our distinguished panelists. Uh, this is actually a high-level segment, uh, starting with uh, our director, Dr. Guler Artan, who is on the, uh, on the high table already, uh, Colonel Hared uh, Hassan, the CEO of uh, Kenya uh, National Disaster uh, Management Agency or Authority. Uh, Colonel Hared, uh, kindly take your seat. Uh, I would like to also invite um, Mr. Ah Dr. Ahmed uh, Aden, uh, who is a Deputy Commissioner of Somalia Disaster Management Agency. Um, Dr. Ahmed, kindly take your seat. Um, we also have invited uh, Dr. Ambassador Dr. Shiferao Saklamariam, who is a Commissioner of Ethiopian Disaster Risk Management um, Commission, uh, who unfortunately is not able to attend physically, but he is joining us uh, virtually. I will ask uh, Kimoto and Julie to make sure that uh, he's uh, listening to this session. Uh, the next distinguished uh, panelist is Dr. Mohammed uh, 
the regional director of IFRC, uh, Dr. Mohammed, uh, kindly take your seat. And uh, finally, we have also uh, Madam Alessandra uh, Casaza, who is heading the UNDP Regional Resilience Hub uh, in Kenya. Alessandra, kindly also take your seat. Uh, colleagues, I think without, without any further ado, I would be inviting um, our distinguished uh, panelists. Uh, we are going to do it this way. The first round will be giving five minutes for each to come and um, answer the specific questions addressed to them. Uh, and finally, the second round will give them one minute to tell us what needs to be done differently in their respective uh, capacities. Uh, we'll start with uh, Colonel Harred. Uh, who is the CEO of uh, Kenya Med uh, Department. Um, Colonel Harred, uh, kindly maybe um, let me read the questions and I invite you to the podium. Uh, the National Disaster, the National Drought Management Agency is, uh, or authority is the one leading the drought management in Kenya, uh, particularly given uh, the challenges. There are significant achievements that the NDMA has been doing, both in data collection, but also coordination and implementation. Uh, given this uh, profile, uh, Colonel, what are the standing challenges? What is the situation of drought in Kenya looks like and what are the standing challenges? If you can address that question, please. Thank you very much. Uh, before I the tackling the question, first of all, I would like to give a brief update on the drought situation. The current drought situation in the country has affected 32 counties, uh, which, which implies nine counties which were not in the arid and semi-arid uh, region have joined the, the counties which are being affected by the drought situation. In Kenya, we have 47 counties, but now 32 counties have been affected by the drought with a population of 6 million Kenyans who are food insecure. And out of these 4.4 million are from the arid and semi-arid regions. That's the 23 counties representing 26% of the population. Nine counties which consider about 45 wards also have been affected by drought with 500,000 Kenyans who are food insecure representing 4% of the population. When you look in terms of the, the acute mal malnutrition, 970,000 970, children below five years have been affected with 242 being in severe category. Also 142,000 breastfeeding and lactating mothers have also joined the category of food insecure. They are, they are suffering from acute mal malnutrition. Now, to, to come to the question, first of all, a Kenyan have actually achieved a lot in terms of addressing the issue of drought. And you find there, there, there's been a, a lot of focus on resilient building and the end drought initiative, which has seen the reduction in terms of the impact of the current drought. Kenya now is facing this, the fifth failed rain. Also, we have maintained the issue of end drought initiatives in the various, uh, our various line ministries, and also as, as well as the, the lower government, as the county government. And the, the issue of the early warning uh, system has enabled the country to prepare for early action, because response is based on a timely response. When you look also in terms of the drought coordination, we have reviewed our coordination structures, both at the national and the county level, and together with also with non-state actors to be able to, to target and to intervene the right time. So in terms of targeting and mapping, that has been, been actually, there's have been a lot of uh, improvement. So the, 
The other issue is also in terms of also mapping the non-state actors operating in the various counties, which we, the government has mapped. And any non-state actors that operate in a region has to operate under what's called the county uh, steering committee, which is normally share, chaired by the governor and the county commissioner at the county level. This has brought uh, order in drought response. So those are some of the uh, achievements the government uh, has, has so far uh, achieved. But when you look in terms of the drought uh, challenges, the, the, the prolonged drought has strained the economy. A lot of focus is on response to drought, which money that was meant to undertake the long-term resilient building is now focused towards on drought response. The government has spent 32 billion Kenya shillings to respond to drought since September uh, 2021, when drought was declared a disaster. This money should have gone towards the resilient building. Also, the communities have, have not had time to recover from shock because of this, the, the continuous uh, drought episode. So also there's a loss of livelihoods where, for example, the pastoralists have lost 2.6 million uh, animals, which is about 1.8 billion Kenya shillings. So, and that affects the livelihood. Also, there is widespread crop failure, especially the arid and semi-arid counties. So those are some of the, the challenges that has come up with the, the issue of the, the drought uh, situation in the country. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Colonel Harrod, for that uh, comprehensive um, assessment of the achievements, uh, but also uh, standing challenges. Um, I would, uh, it's my privilege again to invite uh, the Deputy Commissioner, Dr. Ahmed um, uh, Abdi Aden, uh, to give us an highlight about um, Somalian situation. First, um, what is the draw situation looks like? And uh, again, what are the changes? Specifically, what are the funding gaps at the moment? Thank you, Dr. Ahmed. Bismillah. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank ICBAC, IGAD, and all uh, regional uh, member states and IGAD member states for this for convening these events, which is very important for the people of Horn of Africa in general. In Somalia, when we talk about the Somalia and drought-related issues. I think it's a peculiar, peculiar so for Somalia to talk about the drought because of the uh, compounded factors that are affecting the Somali situation. Uh, as you know, in Somalia, the government, the uh, Federal Republic of Somalia, was overwhelmed by the drought, recurrent droughts, and uh, for the last five decades, which is affected. Lastly, half of the population of the Somali. As you know, last year, November 2021, before one year, it was declared emergency of state in Somalia because of the drought affected the, whole, the, 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 the large population of the Somali people. And also the displacement, the, the, the displacement situation in Somalia is also very critical because of these success, uh, successful, successing uh, drought uh, seasons in, in Somalia. However, the current situation has compounded with the vulnerability at a time when a number of people who need urgent and life-saving humanitarian assistance in my country has risen up to 7.8 million as the last uh, data or in, uh, indicates, despite the drought emergency, funding for humanitarian operations in Somalia this year remains very low and situation is not improving as we know that the predicted rainfall for the coming raining season is also very gloomy and it's not promising. As we know, disaster response receives resources and funds during emergency periods, but in long-term development of disaster management, 
capabilities and prevention, mitigation, preparedness, and resilience building measures are not addressed. This is despite the clear international experience that resource committed to these activities reduce suffering. But with regard to the long sustainable solution is, it is uh, not uh, addressed. Somalia is now in short of resource and funding in disaster risk management for resilience building, especially when considering preparedness, elaborating advanced measures to establish capacities and mechanism to minimize adverse impacts of disasters if and when they occur, and so reduce the intensity or scale of any resilient emergence. So as we speak, the challenges regarded with Somalia is also very complicated when we talk about the insecurity, the accessibility, the hard to reach areas, which is all makes the situation very complicated and very critical. So in Somalia, there is a compounded factors that in terms of a natural disaster, which may be the drought, there are also other disasters which causes to, uh, to, uh, to, to, to exacerbate the situation in, in Somalia. So in Somalia, actually the challenges re uh, represent is in, 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 in the drought related issues, uh, also the displacement population in Somalia. We know many people displaced from their original places, their farmers, their pastoral diseases, they all are now located in the nearby major cities of Somalia, like Baidawa, Mogadishu, Baladwene, Kismayo, and other urban areas. So this population displaces population of about 3 million in, in general, which 1 million of them was just displaced by the last uh, two or one and a half year. So this population also needs to be assisted, which uh, makes the situation very, very hard to, to tackle. In, in, in addition to the, in conclusion, on behalf of the Somali Disaster Management Agency, I would like to, re to reaffirm that our commitment to implementing the national policies and strategies on disaster risk mitigation and continue to strengthen our response capacities ensure that we are fully engaged in the effort to averting, to averting any catastrophic turn in the current drought may take. So thank you very much. I appreciate you are listening. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Ahmed. We do also appreciate and uh, dearly value um, your contribution. Uh, Maybe I can proceed to our next speaker, uh, if IT team can confirm. Okay, Ambassador has dropped, I think. Um, uh, so we'll proceed to uh, our next speaker uh, from IFRC, uh, Dr. Mohamed uh, Muke, who will be uh, giving us a highlight uh, on the humanitarian situation, uh, particularly as the drought is unfolding now for two years. Uh, what are the situations in terms of humanitarian um, emergencies, humanitarian figures. Uh, so what needs to be done along that line? Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, moderator. And um, it gives us great pleasure as IFRC representing all the African National Society in Nairobi to join this platform and to be joining effort to Ziga to address this impending crisis and famine and hunger. Maybe before I share my intervention, what Red Cross Red Crescent is doing in the Horn of Africa and in Africa in general, I just wanted maybe to share one unpleasant and very uncomfortable reality. And I think that is important for all of us to think about that, to reflect on that, uh, to help us maybe go forward with a different um, motivation and drive. I think we all remember the hunger crisis 2011-2012, um, and that it has been a huge challenge for us, all of us, governments, humanitarian community, and civil society to address it. And as a result of that hunger crisis in 2011, we lost at least 250,000 people only in Somalia. And I think that was a huge, uh, not only humanitarian failure, but is developmental failure as well. 
And as such, for us as Red Cross Red Crescent, we take this current impending um, hunger crisis, not only as a humanitarian issue, but also as a developmental issues, as an issue of sustainable development goals, as issue of investment at the community level to make sure that communities, especially high risk areas and chronic um, pockets being supported developmentally uh, to build up the resilience. That has been said in our account, in our community um, engagement and accountability system, which is cover all the 49 countries in Sub-Saharan Africa. We are tracking down the gaps, needs, but also capacities across Africa. Uh, we, in 23 countries in Africa, this is where we see the major needs, including most of the countries in the Horn of Africa. Uh, we see that in our books about 140 million Africans that need urgent um, um, humanitarian assistance and facing acute food insecurity or less quality plan is a hunger. People who cannot feed themselves, not feed them the, 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 their families and cannot even look after their environment and animals. We launch uh, the twin track plans. We launched a regional emergency appeal to provide support in these 24 um, countries, 23 countries. This emergency appeal is fully coordinated with the United Nations. We are focusing mainly on the chronic pockets, hard to reach areas across the continent, Sub-Saharan Africa and the Horn of Africa and the Sahel in Central Africa. Um, we requested support to get about 205 million Swiss francs. So far, we have been funded only 24%. So we have only about 50 million. And our Red Cross, Red Crescent National Societies, including Kenya Red Cross and Somali Red Crescent and Ethiopia Red Cross and Red Cross are delivering these services. And we do both, providing mainly through cash voucher assistance, but also providing and supporting communities for cash based financing with early warning, early actions, and to make sure that the anticipatory um, readiness and mindset is there at the community level. So that is on the short term. We are raising up and we are trying to make sure that we are not going to get a repeat of 2011 because that is fresh in our memories and it should be fresh in our memories. And I don't think we should go again into another failure into the books of the famine in the Horn of Africa. On the long term, we launched our Pan-Africa Initiative for Zero Hunger. And this is fully aligned to the Sustainable Development Goals, fully aligned to the Africa Union Agenda 2063, fully aligned to um, a national governmental targets to zero hunger by 2030. And uh, we as a Red Cross Red Cross and launched that jointly with the Africa Union in November 2022 at Sharm We are targeting 8,000 communities, 60 million people by 2030. And that is also going concurrently. And this is almost the same people in the chronic pockets of hunger in Africa. Um, to bring it back home in the Horn of Africa, we agreed with the GAD and we launched our Africa Horn of Africa Food and Nutrition Resilience Programs. And that is we are now working at the technical level to make sure that is fully aligned with governmental plans in the priority countries in the Horn of Africa. And I should say that we are taking the similar initiative into other um, sub-regional economic blocks, such as SADAC, ECOWAS, et cetera, because they need it there as well. Um, just finally, I wanted to put very clear offer on the table because we as a Red Cross, Red Crescent, quite distinctive organization that have legal attachment, legal connection with government, who are auxiliary to the government by Geneva Conventions and protocols. But at the same time, we are organization that based in the communities, in the civil society fabric, the youth and volunteers. And I should put on the table that in Africa, we're quite proud we have 18,000 branches. Most of these branches are actually at the high risk areas. Places like Wajir, Marsabet, 
uh, Somali region in Ethiopia, Darfur in Sudan, et cetera, et cetera. And those 18,000 branches are very well organized with international uh, rules and regulations. We have in them 1.8 million volunteers across Sub-Saharan Africa in 49 countries. We have 11,000 staff coordinating this network. And we are happy to put this network um, to support national government to achieve zero hunger by 2030, but also to work very closely with the United Nations, with international NGOs, civil society, and private sector. Because we believe the job at hand is very complicated, very quite complicated for us to achieve saving lives and addressing symptoms while addressing root causes, which is more important. And we believe both of them need to happen at the same time. And I think we should not accept defeat. Many people I talk to, they think maybe it's too ambitious to zero hunger by 2030. I don't think so. I think we should set the bar a little bit higher to support the governmental um, authorities to make sure that by 2030, we can have zero hunger in Africa, including in the Horn of Africa. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh... Uh, okay, uh, for highlighting um, the challenges, but also what uh, FRC is doing. Uh, I think um, it's natural now to go from the humanitarian landscape to now development uh, approaches. Uh, Alexandra, if you can highlight what are the development pathways to this uh, crisis, the very prolonged drought, which some are thinking is that a new normal going forward. So kindly address the development pathways along that line. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ahmed, and all protocols observed. Um, I want to begin my remarks by being a little bit provocative. And I want to start by saying that the problem is not really the drought, is not really the crisis. The drought is here to stay, and unfortunately, because of climate change, is going to worsen in intensity and severity. So we need to really shift our focus to what really matters. The reason why the drought uh, is a problem in this region is because of structural, the structural vulnerabilities of the people in the Horn of Africa, or certain communities here in the, in the Horn of Africa. So if we want to talk about development pathways to build resilience, uh, uh, in the Horn of Africa, we really need to talk about what are the underlying drivers of vulnerabilities of these communities and how can we tackle them. So what are the underlying drivers of vulnerability that we see in UNDP and that we need to start tackling with long-term development solutions to build resilience? And first and foremost, I would like to start with what I call the elephant in the room and is what I mean with elephant in the room is really the multidimensional poverty that many of these communities affected by the drought are actually suffering from. This is a longstanding um, under development in some of this community, development deficits that needs to be addressed, gaps that needs to be addressed. This is about being energy poor, this is about being income poor, this is about low access to services such as water, sanitation, health. I want to talk about also economic development and sources of livelihood, because this is at the core of what makes this community so vulnerable. Communities in the Horn, in some parts of the Horn, most affected by the droughts, are dependent on one single sector, agriculture. And this one single sector is also climate uh, vulnerable. So to move forward and to make communities more resilient, it is about to invest much more in uh, climate change adaptation, making agriculture much more climate resilient. But it's also about diversifying the economies. In UMDP, we have seen that countries and communities that are, that are most vulnerable to crisis, not just drought, but multiple interconnected crises, is also the fact that these economies are not diversified. And in this region, there are so many opportunities, just to mention a few. 
Somalia, Kenya, even Djibouti, the potentials that the blue economy uh, actually offers. Social protection systems, this is what we have seen actually builds resilience uh, of communities that are affected by the, crowds, the, the droughts. Ethiopia shines as uh, one example. In 2011, Ethiopia was able to avert the worst impacts of the droughts because they did leverage their social protection systems. And here I'm not talking about just the cash handouts at the community level. I'm talking about national systems that either needs to be strengthened or needs to be built uh, uh, altogether. I also want to talk about uh, um, access to water. What we have found in UNDP is that water, which is obviously at the core of the issue in the context of the drought, uh, is an issue not because there is lack of water. Many studies, World Bank, our studies actually show water is there, is underground. The issue is access. So for us, it is an issue of really building synergies and coalition across different development partners to really ramp up investments in not only water infrastructure, but also institutional infrastructure and building those national local level systems to give access to water uh, to populations. Natural resources uh, uh, and uh, nature-based solutions. Uh, very brief, briefly, I want to close with a couple of things. We have found that nat the natural resources on which these communities depend for their livelihood are already depleted. This triggers actually a vicious cycle of access and exploitation of natural resources, depletion, further depletions of the same and conflict. This is a vicious cycle that we can actually interrupt and, and close by building in uh, natural resource conservation, sustainable management of the same, uh, and nature-based solutions. And I want to close with something. I have not exhausted the whole list of development pathways to building resilience, but I want to mention one that is very relevant, for example, in the context of Somalia but also of Ethiopia and, uh, uh, and Kenya, is the issue of development solutions for, for displaced populations. We are seeing that people are moving from drought affected areas to other drought affected areas. And a number of them are actually find refuge in peri-urban areas. This is where they are most likely going to stay for the foreseeable future. 10, 20, 30 years, uh, they're probably never going to go back. It is important to ramp up investments in development solutions to make durable solutions more sustainable, giving them access to services, livelihood, water, sanitation, health, uh, uh, access to justice, and of course, uh, a more li livable env environment for the foreseeable future. Thank you, Dr. Ahmed. Thank you very much, uh, Alessandra. Um, as we set to address the pressing humanitarian emergencies, we should also put um, important emphasis and attention to uh, medium term to long term uh, resilience building. Those are the development pathways uh, that Alessandra has highlighted. Uh, I think the ambassador is uh, now available. Uh, Ambassador um, Shifarao, if you are hearing me, uh, kindly also give us uh, an highlight of Ethiopian situation in terms of the droughts, particularly um, what are the level of impacts uh, of this prolonged droughts, but also what are the funding uh, required to meet those uh, needs? If you can kindly highlight uh, those, those questions. Can you hear me, Dr. Ahmedin? Thank you so much. Is it, yes, uh, we can hear if you can speak louder. Thank you so much, uh, everyone. And uh, I'd like to really appreciate bringing all of us in this very platform. And uh, my greetings to everyone, all protocols uh, well observed. Uh, it will be very important to start to say is the deepening and expanding drought, uh, which we should say very much unprecedented. 
Uh, in fact, uh, with the various uh, historical backgrounds, I will start with what is happening from uh, late 2020. And in fact, it was a history, we were having such a problem in every 100 years, later on every 50 years, later on every 10 years, every five years. Now we're experiencing very much a devastating uh, drought condition back to back, which makes uh, everything very difficult to operate. And as we speak, we have uh, close to 16 million people that are uh, being affected. And out of a uh, number of uh, regions, we have nine regional states that are also being affected. So it means the situation is uh, getting rather uh, worsening here uh, in our uh, country. And we had uh, the, the for, for the last uh, five seasons, four to five seasons, there was uh, the, what you call a scanty rain, as I already said, uh, was earlier speaker, with the population that are rain dependent on rain fed agriculture. Uh, this means a very much uh, a difficult circumstances which we are uh, facing with. In doing so, we wanted to respond to through what we call a joint uh, humanitarian response program, where uh, all actors, all partners are doing what you call uh, two types, uh, two, two uh, seasonal assessments. Based on the seasonal assessments, we are also coming with a, a number. Uh, and this time for 2023, our HRP requirement uh, is now about 20.1 million. And out of those 80%, which is like uh, 16 million of uh, uh, these uh, beneficiaries are basically drought induced uh, requirement. And for this, uh, we are, um, we, estimated a total of about 3.99 billion uh, USD uh, to make sure uh, these things will not uh, end up into the loss of uh, human lives, because we have already paid adequate amount of uh, the level of disaster to say, in terms of uh, livestock losses, losing of uh, coping mechanism, and the, the individuals, families, communities being dependent only on handouts because of no uh, foreseeable, uh, to, to what you call durable solution in their hand as well. So I'd like to say in addition to even which is not enough, by the way, last year, we managed only to cover 66% of the humanitarian support uh, demand uh, compared to what was required. And on top of that, we are also looking for a durable solution, particularly focusing on agriculture and uh, water uh, supply schemes in doing so, so that we will uh, somehow match the immediate needs with uh, long-term interventions. Now, I think the caveat is uh, all of us are very much agreeable on that, but on the other hand, making practical uh, that uh, matching or balancing the humanitarian with the durable solutions is now an issue. In fact, I would like also to say a few words on the uh, positive side. There are a number of durable solutions and interventions that are happening to a number of partners' uh, support as well. In uh, all regional states uh, in our own country, there are a number of model durable solutions which we need to expand so that we can uh, reach out to uh, all the needy uh, beneficiaries uh, in the country. So I'm sure this platform will help us to navigate some of those uh, balancing the humanitarian as well as uh, the long-term duration related activities. Here I would like to mention really the agriculture and the water sector, in addition to other social services are very, very much uh, critical in doing so, building the community resilience and also be, be building the capacity of uh, all uh, structural entities uh, being also an important parameters. I'd like to uh, stop uh, here and uh, probably if there's time and loss, I'll come back uh, later on. Thank you so much again, uh, Dr. Ahmadin, back to you. Thank you very much, uh, Ambassador. We very much appreciate uh, again those interventions um, from your side. Uh, I think balancing the pressing humanitarian needs with Community resilience is, uh, I think, the core 
uh, emphasizing on the agriculture and water sector. Thank you, Ambassador. Um, may I now invite um, Dr. Guled Artan, uh, Director of ICPAC. Particularly, this is a setting for Climate Outlook Forum, and we understand uh, the value, the place of forecast, but we wish to hear from uh, the boss what uh, is the real um, value of early warnings, forecasts, particularly to um, early warn communities, which some say is also, if you are forewarned, that means you are forearmed. So Dr. Goulet, kindly uh, give us your, your thoughts on that. Thank, thank you, Ahmed. Uh, good afternoon, and all protocols are observed. <clears throat> First of all, actually, in this region, what we have is not a problem of, of lack of forecast, although that doesn't mean we don't need to improve the, our forecast. And we don't need uh, to reach more people. Um, also, we, we shouldn't confuse two things. Drought and disaster are two different things. Drought is a natural thing. It happens everywhere, but it shouldn't become a disaster if you are pre better prepared. And uh, to follow up what Alessandro is saying, why, why drought is becoming a disaster in this region is, is a bit complex. And let's remember also that Food security is not only food availability, but it's also affordability. If you can't afford, even if it's plentiful, you are food insecure. Uh, I wish that I had a graph that I, I, I use uh, a few times. In this region, uh, the people who are in need of humanitarian aid are increasing every year. No matter what, we have a, maybe plateau, then they're going up. To give you an example, it took, uh, in the, during the drought of 2010-11, we had around 17 million people in need of humanitarian aid. Today, on the last assessment done, uh, if I remember, I remember what it was a, a month ago, is 46.5 million people. So it's grown exponentially. The whys are, 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 are complex. Uh, to give you an, another example, uh, the Egypt region had, in 1960, it had around 50 million people. Today, it has around 300 million people. Uh, the land has become degraded. Uh, uh, I'm from Somalia. Uh, I read somewhere that the last elephant that was roaming near her this was killed in 1952. It's unimaginable taking elephants near, near her Giza. Because there are no elephants even uh, till you reach the Saba now. So the land has changed. You have more people. Uh, uh, the weather is drier, definitely. Especially, especially mom. Mom is drier. No doubt about that. Uh, OMD, uh, when I say moms, I mean uh, the long rain season, uh, March, April, uh, May, has increased a bit, uh, has decreased, definitely. Uh, we, are, we are hotter. All, all uh, the long term, uh, we are covering 146 uh, stations uh, from the region. All of them, temperature has increased. Close to 1.5, all of them. What that means, evapotranspiration has increased. The water requirement went up. You have a little bit less rain. That is no brainer, basically. Uh, on 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 the on the uh, early warning uh, benefit, actually the the head of states of this region had they are quite wise. At the end of the drought of 2010, 2011, uh, during the summit of uh, Nairobi, where Idris and the Eagle Disaster Resilience Program was initiated, uh, there is declaration. The first item of that declaration is support ITPA, the first declaration. So they knew that uh, you need uh, an early warning uh, to, to build resilience. So early warning is part of building resilience. 
in general, our our forecast uh, uh, does increase uh, throughout the years. Um, the but uh, uh, forecast uh, the accuracy also uh, it's not only accuracy. You, you also have to reach the last mile. So those of you who are here, uh, the last two days, you have seen we have uh, a co-producing, uh, client co-producing. And the reason we're doing those is that we don't give the information the way we want it, but the way you want, and you can understand. Uh, there is a, also one thing that's lacking in this region, actually, is, a, is a, more than early one, is air action. It's tying up early warning to an early action and a set of procedures. Uh, hopefully, uh, but that's, that's not for ICPAC, it's for the, for the member countries. And we need to work on early warning that's tied to an early action. We need also uh, uh, maybe to implement more an anticipatory uh, forecast to act early. Once there is a forecast, Preposition things to act early, is waiting for the for the events to happen, especially on drum. Uh, to take the no regret option. I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Atan. Um, those are also very um, important points on early warning. Particularly, you all agree with me, colleagues, that this uh, platform is one of actually. Uh, the flagship activities of ICPAC leading not only member states, but also quite a, diff quite a number of um, partners in giving um, an info warning the next season and uh, what needs to be taken. At least six sectors or plus are always joining three times a year, uh, charting their ways. The only thing we are asking is let's take seriously whatever is issued, uh, particularly with respect to the current drought. The impact is already done. Uh, we are also getting another uh, grim uh, forecast for the coming month, for, for the coming season. Those are the points, colleagues. The time is not in our in our in our in our uh, way, but uh, I would like to give just one minute to each of the speakers, uh, particularly what needs to be done differently. We have been in this vicious cycle of drought in the region over the last seventy plus years. We would like to hear their wisdom on what need to what needs to change really in this region. I will start from Colonel Harred, then um, Alessandra, uh, then uh, Deputy Commissioner Dr. Ahmed and Dr. Mohammed. Colonel. Thank you very much. Uh, basically, considering the drought situation and drought is going to be with us, it's not going anywhere. It is us now to change and see how to adapt within the drought. So basically, as a country in uh, as in Kenya, we are focusing more on now on long-term measures in terms of resilient building of the communities. And as you are aware, drought is basically absence of water. So our focus is in terms of water, public-private partnership on the issue of water. Also try, especially the pastoral community, to see how we can diversify the livelihood. And in terms of agriculture, looking at the, the drought resistant crops and more also focus on the irrigations uh, as opposed to rain fed uh, food production. So, those are the things that we need to do differently to be able to address that, the, the current drought situation. Thank you. Thank you, Alexandra. Thank you. In, in one minute, I would like to say two things that need to change and uh, four things on the how they can change. So one minute. <laughs> so the first thing is really that of uh, moving from the focus on crisis to un addressing the underlying drivers of vulnerabilities. Like Dr. Artan said earlier, a drought does not necessarily need to become a crisis if we prepare well and if we address the underlying drivers of vulnerabilities of people, that means building resilience. The second shift is that of moving away progressively, this is not gonna happen over time, but moving away progressively from dependency on humanitarian response, humanitarian assistance, 
and start building resilience through long-term sustainable investment in long-term development. But how do we do that? Very quickly, four hows. The first one is uh, what we need to think about is that the Horn of Africa of today is going to be very different, is different from the Horn of Africa of 20 years from now. Things are going to change because of climate change, but also because of the, so, the, the, the geopolitical dynamics uh, that uh, uh, we are all witnessing and multiple crises that we are all seeing happening across the world. We live in a polycrisis uh, um, world. So we need to start imagining it, the, the, what the, the Horn of Africa will look like in 20 years and start investing today for the kind of future for the kind of, you know, uh, plausible and desirable scenario of an a Horn of Africa that we see tomorrow. The second thing speaks to ownership and leadership, because whatever we do in this uh, region is going to be led um, by member states and owned by member states and regional institutions like EGAD. So as development partners need to be supporting and following the vision and the leadership of member states and regional institutions. Third, very important is uh, the need to work across the humanitarian development and peace nexus. I'm very glad that uh, UNDP today is sitting with IFRC. This, this is the spirit within which we need to continue working in this region. We need to make sure that with the, whatever we do to support, to save lives through humanitarian support also has continuity and long-term uh, results through investment in uh, recovery, preparedness, and also long-term resilience. And lastly, I want to talk about money because none of this can actually happen and take place without money. Money is there, particularly in the private sector. Uh, commitments have been made at COP27 on climate finance. So development partners need to rally around um, and, and partner with the private sector, with the, uh, development partners to really make sure that the money for making these long-term investments on the table and available to uh, countries in the Horn of Africa to realize this future. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alessandra. Uh, Deputy Commissioner, Dr. Ahmed. Thank you very much. Uh, I think we are aware, all aware that the common presence of the drought in the region, and we foresee that it is will be it will continue as we see the temperature will be. Uh, as we prove it today in our representation is that it will increase and the global warming will be continue. So therefore there is there should be some strategies and mechanism to overcome this drought, the current droughts. We have to live with this situation in terms of what uh, making innovative water resource uh, management solution with long-term resilience. I think the resilience, building building resilience for the vulnerable communities is the most important thing we have to 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 talk. Also, when we are talking in Somalia, in the case of the displaced people, we have to maintain strategies related with durable solutions and returning to the original places in order to make their life normal. We know that humanitarian assistance will not take people out of the, the critical situation they are living in. We have to innovate. We have to formulate a new strategies and mechanics, mechanism and utilize new technologies with, to combat the, really, the, the recurrent droughts that, and the, as long as now we are living in the era of humanitarian assistance, there should be linkage between the humanitarian programs and developmental programs. So this transition will go to the developmental uh, phase. So thank you very much, I, I appreciate it. Thank you very much, um, uh, Dr. Ahmed and uh, Dr. Mohammed also, please. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Ahmed. Um, 
I, I would propose that collectively, governments, civil society, United Nations, and private sector, we need to scale up in three areas. Number one, to scale up on humanitarian diplomacy, to bring out the real voice of the most vulnerable, um, and to make sure that we are getting evidence, enough evidence from the ground. We as a Red Cross, Red Crescent Network, and volunteers and branches, we are happy to provide real-time information from all of these marginal uh, pockets of needs, pastoralists, agro-pastoralists, and small farmers. Secondly, I think uh, we need to scale up our resource mobilization. I agree fully with UNDP, Alexander, that um, we need to look maybe more at domestic because these issues with competing needs on the globe, what happening in Europe, Turkey, Syria, Pakistan, um, Ukraine, all of that, that's impacting. We can see the impact on the resources we are getting, both for the humanitarian assistance, but also for development. And I think we need to change our strategy and to scale up our resource mobilizations in different ways, including domestic resource mobilization. And um, hard for us in Red Cross now, we are tracking down the media, national media, regional media, international media. It's very hard to get coverage for this hunger crisis, it's just going silent, even in our national medias. Uh, and that two areas need to be connected, the scale up of humanitarian diplomacy based on evidence and the scale up of resource mobilization. Finally, I would suggest that we need to scale up the investment on safeguarding. There is no short of investment in macro development. African governments invest every day on development. They put resources there. We as a humanitarian community and uh, private sector put resources, but there is no enough safeguarding. So whenever there is a shock, whether it is floods or drought, et cetera, especially for the most vulnerable groups, they go back to square zero again. And I think that's very important for the safeguarding. And we as a Red Cross Red Crescent on the ground in the high risk areas, this is top priority for us to safeguard against an investment of development. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Dr. Mohammed. I think we have uh, Ambassador. Okay, uh, Ambassador Shfero, kindly um, take a minute also and tell us what needs to change uh, to break this vicious cycle of drought uh, that comes in um, year in and year out in this, this part of the region. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much uh, again. I think I'm uh, getting uh, a good recommendations which can uh, definitely apply for all of us. I think number one uh, point which I'd like to highlight as a way forward is uh, to strengthen some of the homegrown initiatives that are uh, uh, able to bring us to climate resilience, green economy. For example, in Ethiopian case, we have what's called the Dry Lands uh, Irrigation Initiative, as uh, pastoralists and agro pastoralists are mostly affected in this uh, drought condition where the green legacy of uh, addressing the whole issue and also the diversification of the household income, in fact, including the, the feeding, uh, the food practices uh, as well. Second, I'd like to raise this issue of enhanced response, both for uh, humanitarian as well as uh, uh, durable solutions. Uh, I'm uh, mentioning this because the, the response itself, even for humanitarian response uh, is not, uh, uh, equating what is required. So I'd really like to raise this issue of uh, enhanced mobilization of resources and in doing so, focus even in uh, local capacities as well, particularly at the community level. And the uh, third point is really the investment, investment in water, investment in agriculture and investment on uh, climate related adaptation, mitigation mechanisms, in fact, through cooperation of uh, high learning institution and so on and so forth, uh, I think would be a very important. And that is building of uh, impact-based multi-hazard early warning, early action system so that the risk knowledge is being shared by everyone so that preparedness can uh, take up the place. And my final point is what you call this inter-regional uh, cooperation. And uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Ahmed and yourself, IGAD, for bringing us together. What it means is the problem doesn't know the borders, the boundaries, but the practices, if we can share among ourselves, 
including the data generation information uh, to, to sharing mechanism, it would be a very, very important uh, engagement so that we can act together, we can mobilize our own local resources, regional resources. In fact, one of the resources is the regional experiences uh, that are scattered here and there so that we can scale it up. So such platform I'm sure is uh, very much helpful to that, to that end. Again, uh, I really appreciate and uh, even though I'm from Addis Ababa, my colleagues are there, everyone is there. I can assure you that in spirit, in action, we'll be working very closely. I think the bottom line is all of us now, the durable solution is the way forward, but the commitment, the resource mobilization, the investment towards that end is very, very critical. Back to you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Ahmed. Thank you very much, Ambassador. We also uh, very much appreciate that you join us um, despite uh, your tight schedule. Uh, colleagues, I don't want to waste your time repeating what uh, uh, the distinguished panelists have said. Uh, we appreciate and we have taken note of uh, all the wisdom uh, from the uh, distinguished panelists. Um, thank you very much. And I would like uh, you all to upload uh, the high table. Thank you very much. Uh, may I now invite Dr. Um, maybe we can send uh, our delegates uh, to kindly. Uh, may I now invite uh, Dr. David to come and uh, read the statements of Gakov uh, 63 and also close uh, the session. Dr. David. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, our protocol observed. I think I'll introduce myself again, David Gikungu, Director, Kenya Meteorological Services. And um, as the country host, in terms of the work of forecasting, I have this uh, privilege and responsibility to read the statement that forms the consensus uh, decision um, from the models that we have used to develop the forecast, which we have discussed from all circles. And here follows now the consensus forecast and the statement thereof. After almost three years of persistent drought conditions, IGAD Climate Prediction and Application Center today announced that below normal rainfall is expected in most parts of the Greater Horn of Africa over the next three months. We are talking about March, April, and May. Delegates gathering in Nairobi for the 63rd Greater Horn of Africa Climate Outlook Forum examined the forecast for the March, April, May 2023 season, which points towards depressed rainfall and high temperatures. In parts of Ethiopia, Kenya, Somalia, and Uganda that have been most affected by the current drought this could be the sixth failed consecutive rainfall season. The probability for lower than normal rainfall is also enhanced for parts of Rwanda, Burundi, Eastern Tanzania, and Western South Sudan. 
At the same time, wetter than normal conditions are expected over the cross-border areas of Ethiopia and South Sudan, Northwestern Kenya, and parts of Central and Southern Tanzania. Warmer than normal temperatures are likely across the region, particularly over Djibouti, Eritrea, Sudan, Northwestern South Sudan, Southern and, so and Northeastern Ethiopia, Northern Somalia, Northern and Western Kenya, and parts of Southeastern and Western Tanzania. The March to May season constitutes an important rainfall season, especially in the equatorial parts of the Greater Horn of Africa, where it contributes up to 60% of the total annual rainfall. As Dr. Guled Atan, ICPAC director, explained that even if the general conditions for the season do not look favorable, people can still take advantage of rainfall. He urges all to consult ICPAC's weekly and monthly forecasts, which have a high degree of predictability. ICPAC, ICPAC analysis indicates raised chances of a delayed start of the rainfall season, that is delayed onset over northeastern Tanzania and raised chances of an early onset of a much of western South Sudan. Elsewhere, probabilities favor a normal onset timing with delayed or on early onset only in small pockets. In the region severely hit by drought, the current trends are worse than those observed during the drought of the years 2010 and 2011. The Food Security and Nutrition Working Group, co-chaired by IGAD and FAO, estimates that close to 23 million people are currently highly food insecure in Ethiopia, Kenya, and Somalia. It is likely that the situation in the affected areas will intensify through the transition period of March, April, May, 2023. Beyond this point, the situation will be informed by the season's performance. However, considering that 11 million livestock have already died and that the March, April, May harvest start around August, any positive impacts will be realized much later. In view of these grim realities, IGAD's executive secretary, Dr. Wakne Gebeyehu, has called for an immediate scaling up of humanitarian and risk reduction efforts. National governments, humanitarian and development actors must adopt a no regret approach before it's too late. What we are saying, ladies and gentlemen, is that dry conditions are highly likely to continue over the Horn of Africa during the March to May 2023 rainfall season. End of statement. It is now my pleasure to declare the Garkov session 26, number 63 officially closed and closing also the session that we have had. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Gikungo. Uh, we are closing this session, but we are opening uh, side events. We are going to have two side events. We will have CONFA, understanding the value of GACO focus products for specific sectors in East Africa, opportunities and barriers. They will be, remain in this room. And then we have the second side event or ACRE on lessons on participatory climate and diversity development and the communication for farmer decision making. 
that will take place fifth floor Zambez room. So confirm group remain here and uh, uh, the other, those who are joining Akure will go to fifth floor Zambez room. Uh, we are late, but I think you can extend. In between, you can take your coffee break. Uh, so I think we can say this session is closed, but now we are inviting people for those side events. One in this room, and the other one, uh, fifth floor Zabez room. Thank you very much. <laughs>